you get the scrutiny. You get the pain train when it comes down to it. You don't get remembered for the touchdowns. You don't get remembered for the teams you saved, the National Guard team you saved. You only get remembered for being a monster, right? I was probably the, the sixth or seventh dude as far as in the Marine Corps off that 53 in Afghanistan right after 9-11. I was like, man, I don't know. He's like, hey, listen, look into Blackwater. And at the time, it was the wild, wild west, man. You know, we would get in shoots all the time and then all hell breaks loose. That would change the course and direction of my life for many, many years. If I did something so dishonorable and I have 10 days left to get out of the Navy, why are you trying to give me all the bells and whistles? I said, no. So I flew to Lexington, Tennessee, started guarding John McAfee. He says, right when you think you cannot take one more second he said, that's when you're about halfway done. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 17 years on active duty uh, and reserve time, both as a Marine as a, and as a Navy SEAL. I'm going to delve into his career doing that and, uh, and get right into it. He did spend four years uh, at Blackwater. He's the founder of uh, Touchpoint Nation, which is his own personal warrior tribe that he's uh, culminating. And uh, he also was initially a bodyguard, right-hand man, and then ultimately the CEO of McAfee, which uh, led to some other life-changing events that we're going to talk about. Not to be uh, confused with the legend James Patches Watson, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Jimmy Watson. Thank you, thank you. And not to be confused with Wes Watson either. Yeah. Everybody's like, you guys brothers? I'm like, yeah. nah, I've talked to him. He's cool, dude. Yeah, I've, I've never met him, but uh, yeah, I, I, He's do, cool, I do like the content. Um, what's the last full book that you read? Uh, Art of War. Sun and Tzu's Art of War? Sun Tzu, many yeah. times over. It's um, kind of a book about, it's kind of a book you meditate on, right? Yeah. What uh, What's your biggest takeaway from it? Biggest takeaway is uh, they, uh, Sun Tzu said once um, to never back your enemy into uh, a corner, into a cliff or a river, uh, because if you do, uh, he'll fight like a ferocious tiger. Always leave your enemy with escape. And that's when Sun Tzu's lieutenants and other generals understood why he backed his own enemy into a corner. Because he knew that if he left no escape in their life, if he burned the bridges, so to speak, crossed the Rubicon, that there was no other uh, point of return. So there was only success and victory. And that's been the story of my life, is being uh, backed into a corner, uh, backing myself into a corner, yeah. those self-imposed corners. And that's what I love about that book is it's on strategy, art of war. And, uh, you know, I've had to, I've been, in, I've been uh, with my back up against that corner and I know what it feels like. And it makes you fight like a ferocious tiger. And yeah. sometimes that's the only way. Yeah. Uh, I dig it. I, mean, I read it a long time ago, but uh, prob probably worth a revisit. Uh, do you have a favorite quote? Uh I don't, I, let's see. Um, yeah, I like Mark Twain's, uh, a lie will travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on his shoes. Yeah, yeah that's the fucking truth. Um, I love that one. That's um, a great one. If time travel were possible, where would you go and when and why? If time travel uh, was possible, I would probably... Uh, go back and do some things over in my life. Yeah, yeah. Would uh, would going back to to meet Jesus be on the list of uh, something you'd want to do, or is that something you'd actually rather not do? I don't think I would do that. Uh, he lived a hard life in a hard time, yeah. and he was hard as nails. And uh, you know, having having already met Jesus in my own life, or that man calling Yeshua, Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus, having met that man. Uh, personally in my life or having him meet me, I like to say, because I didn't really meet him. I was too lost to meet him. So when he met me at Operation Restore Warrior, and it was just a place where guys prayed that he would come in and do the heavy lifting. And when he met me, 
that was my meeting with Jesus. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was my big meeting. Uh, mentioning doing things over, um, what would you what would you do over in your life? God, I would I would do I would do a lot of things over in my life. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry so much about things. I wouldn't be anxious about certain aspects of my life. Um, you know, um, there's there's uh, maybe too many to 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 recount. You know, there's a lot of regrets of you know not. I would have held my brother longer before he died. You know, my little brother. I would have hugged him before he uh, before he went off the deep end. I wouldn't have been Mike. I wouldn't have been so hard. Uh, I wouldn't have been so hard on myself. Although that got me to places in my life being hard on myself, self-critical, self-internalizing. But I definitely uh, will go back and hug my little brother and, and say, hey, man, it's going to be okay. Let me, let me help you out more yeah. and not been so, hey, bro, suck it up. You know, you know, do, you know be a man. Because some, some guys can't process it like that. Yeah. Some guys don't have the willpower to get through things. Yeah. You know? That's tough to hear. I mean, I, I know for me, like I, I think about, if I had done this different, if I hadn't done this, et cetera. But I also, you know, try not to live in the rear view mirror that way. And in, in that, uh, I don't know where I would be now if I had done anything different, you know? So, uh, to me, I, I try to just make peace with, uh, with it that way. But, um, what's something you wish you were better at? <clears throat> I wish I was better at communicating to, um, me and the message of hope, you know, I'm always trying to, better sharpen that sword and better myself, Mike, and uh, trying to get that message across to guys like, hey, man, there's hope. Yeah. Like, don't give up. Like, like there's, there's a brighter day tomorrow. But how do you articulate that to somebody? How do you tell, how do you tell a guy that, you know? Yeah. So that's something I'm always, uh, my communication to other, the, the men out there, the yeah. warriors, you know? Yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. Um, do you have an EDC? Uh, and if so, what is it? An EDC. Everyday carry. Do you carry um, in Florida? I don't carry in Florida. I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of carrying. Uh, the FBI took my uh, weapons for a while, and that was hard on me, Mike, because when, when the F, when that, was, that was one of the, my biggest concerns is when I got wrapped up and, and, uh, and with the potential of being uh, found uh, criminally liable uh, for these crimes – is losing all my weapons. I was like, well, what about those antique rifles that I have, that Mosin Nagant that I love so much? And all that was going to go out the window. Uh, so I, I got the weapons back and stuff. And uh, I, I definitely like a, a Glock. I like the Glock 40, you know, MP40 shield. It's, it's kind of, it's, I, like, I like something I could put in my pocket and hold while I'm talking to you and you don't even know it, right? Yeah. So, but you don't carry. I carry if I'm in Texas, you yeah. know. I ain't carrying now because I just came from Miami, Florida. Yeah. Why? Uh, so why not in Florida? Um, it's um, I, I live in a condo around a bunch of people with my uh, Lamborghinis, and and I mean violence can happen anywhere, right? And I'm a big advocate of carrying. I just don't do it for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why. Huh. That's a good question. That's interesting. Um. Is there anything else that you always carry on you other than cell phone, wallet, keys? Like, is there is there a, an asterisk in there that might surprise somebody? No. Uh, Nothing? I don't even carry cash. Yeah? No, uh, I don't uh, carry much. Yeah. Guys, real quick, uh, I've recently launched Patreon uh, for the all-inclusive mic drop experience. This goes above and beyond just ad-free. Yes, you are getting ad-free episodes, but you're getting before and after uh, bonus footage of myself and the guest in stu studio in uh, many instances outside of the studio doing jujitsu, dog stuff, car, motorcycle, uh, recovery, fitness, lifestyle, all kinds of different things. All the different things that I have going on uh, are included in that Patreon page. We're uh, releasing content multiple times a day, every single day. Uh, and I want to offer that to you guys. Uh, just go to my Patreon page. The link is in every description or uh, any any platform that I'm on, uh, and come come enjoy that experience with me. That that content is for you guys. It's what you want to see. It's about you. It's about what uh, what world you want to peek into in terms of all the different things that I have my hands in. Uh, and we're we're bringing that to you guys just for you. And I I uh, want to take one quick second to just say thank you to everybody who already has signed up. Uh, without your support, we couldn't, uh, couldn't do what we do for you. So, uh, thank you to you guys. And I look forward to seeing you in there.
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Uh, what time do you get up and what do the first three hours of your day look like? I get up at six in the morning. Uh, I go, I don't, I, I, I don't pick up my phone. I might pick up my phone, Mike, to check the time like this. Yeah. And then I throw that thing as far as I can and I sit there in deep meditation, thought, and prayer, I say, God, what would you have me do today? That's, my, that's the first words of my, out of my mouth. God, Jesus, what would you have me do today? You know, Sun Tzu said, ere the battle is won in the general's temple, meaning you better sit your ass down in the morning and get some kind of direction, some kind of revelation, some kind of purpose, you know, and in, in reignition in your life. To, to understand and prioritize the day. And that, that's what I do to calm myself in the morning, to I isolate myself in, in, that, in that pure quietness. So that can, that, can, that can lead into an hour, two hours yeah. back in the day when I didn't have that newborn. Yeah. Um, and then I go work out. I try to hit one of my Frogman Warrior workouts. I, I try to blast my body, you know, because it ain't about – the aesthetics. The aesthetics are the byproduct of you just working hard, you know, your muscles and stuff. But for me, it's about if stuff goes down, right? Mm -hmm. You ask, you know, about the carrying and stuff. I believe in carry. I have a weapon at the house ready all the time. Now, when I go to the store or something, sometimes I don't take it, you know, things like that. But always be ready at all, at all times, physically fit. Because if something goes down, as you know, you know, it's it's gonna wear your ass out. There's gonna be it's gonna be a hard time. Firefights may not last a long time. Maybe they last a long time, but you'll be exhausted so fast, like in a real fight. Yeah. And you got to be prepared at all times. Yeah. Do you uh, train combatives at all? And I, I used to box. Did Muay Thai in Thailand. Uh, did some stand up fighting and stuff. And but um, now I just train my ass off, man. Yeah. Just working yeah. out. Yeah. Weight wise. Uh, where are you originally from? I'm from Milshu, Texas. I'm from West Texas, brother. Yeah. Milshu, yep. And how far is that from, uh, say, Lubbock? It's an hour away. Okay, so it's, it's like it's out 90 in the middle minutes. of fucking nowhere. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I lived between a feedlot and a dairy really? most of my life, uh, in, in, in most of my young adult years. But I loved it. I lived yeah. on a ranch. I, I lived on the, the Milshu, Texas ranch, they okay. called it, and, um, and did a lot of playing army out there and, and with my little brother and, and had a, a beautiful time when I was a kid. I hated school. Yeah. I freaking hated school, but, but just love being outdoors, Mike. And yeah. it was a big, it was a big dry land, Texas farm, a couple thousand acres out there. And it had these old cook houses out there. Me and my brothers would go set fires in them and stuff, get in all kinds of trouble, <laughs> bust out some antique glass, you know, just real, yeah. real bad kids, you know, yeah. too. You had a younger brother. Did you have other brothers? Or other I, I had a little brother and uh, Dan and um, an older sister. Okay. So I was the middle. And what uh, what did your parents do? Uh, did they run the ranch? Is that my dad was a, a farmer slash rancher? You know, would run cows, would would plant the fields with wheat. I did a lot of tractor driving when I was little. Sometimes my dad he would drive me out there, uh, let me shoot some prairie dogs. You know. Uh, which helped me out later on, on in life with marksmanship. And then he set me on the tractor with a sandwich, and I would just, I would just plow the field. It was free work for him, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, yeah, he was a Texas judge uh, and a crop duster for 17 years. That wow. kind of done it all, you know. Yeah. What, uh, what age were you when he had you running a tractor with a sandwich all fucking day? I, man, I'm telling you, I was probably 12 years old. Yeah. Yep. Um, did you ever have any accidents on that thing? Man, one time he he would tell me, like he would give me the full rundown, and he was a perfectionist, and he would say, well, you know, you got to do this nozzle, you got to check this, you got to check the water, the you know, spray some ether in there. I love that smell, you know, <laughs> ether and gasoline. <laughs> just loved it. He'd be greasy and grimy. Yeah. And I was always like, man, I, I want to be like him, you know. He yeah. was rough and tough, big, 
massive hands, rough hands. And, uh, I mean, he just, he was all business, you know? Yeah. Always cut or bleeding or something, didn't care, you know, blood coming out, you know, from the bob wire, stretching fences. And uh, he would tell me this big check checklist like I somehow got it, right? Yeah. And uh, one time he, hold me to, he told me to hold the button down on the tractor while he got out and checked the engine. And it was the ignition. And it was just, well, you know, it started up, and I just kept holding down the button. And I, I was getting tired, and my hand was getting tired, and my arm was getting tired. I was getting burnt out. And he was out there for 30 minutes. He came back up and saw me still holding that down. He was so mad. He slapped me. He was like, get what the, you know. Yeah. You know, I was like, I, I, I was just doing what you told me to, like Forrest yeah. Gump, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of hard times on the farm. Was he uh, physically hard on you? Like, I mean, did he, was he heavy-handed? He, my dad was uh, is uh, legit as it gets. I can't say that at all. If I if I had a beating, it was coming, man. Yeah. I mean, because he was stressed out. He was rolling and going. Big shoes to fill. Uh, I remember he came in one day. He was dirty. You know, he, he's you know drinking tea, caffeine all day, uh, Texas tea. And he came in, and my mom said, "Tell him what you did." And I said, "All right." Me and my brother stole cigarettes at the store. You know, and little bitty kids. Always wild, and um, and uh, you know we had done something else, sold a forty or something, and we're drinking forties and hit, hit them under this makeshift thing in our room, you know. And she found all of our paraphernalia, you know, and uh, she had busted us. And he says, "Is that right?" And I said, "I said yes, sir." And I was scared. He said, "All right, go clean up. Let's go eat at Leal's, this Mexican restaurant." And that was it, you know, because uh, and I'll never forget that his temperance at the time, you know, and then and then. And then other times he would just get just frustrated with us and just, you know, you know, give us the good old Texas, you know, SWAT, you know, which we deserve. He wasn't abusive at all or nothing like that. You he's know, just hard on you. He's he's hard, you know, yeah. but 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 in a good way, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, did your mom just was she a stay at home mom or did she uh, do anything for work? My mom, brother. She uh, was a Coca-Cola model, a flight attendant, brand F flight attendant when it was real selective, when it was really hard to be a flight attendant, a model. She met my dad on the airplane uh, 40-something years later. Uh, they're uh, still married, wow. doing real well. This lady don't have uh, – she's, she's missing her fingerprints. And um, sometimes I'll look at them and I'll say, Mom, that's crazy because she was – a court reporter for 30 something years mm. and just pounding that machine like this. And believe it or not, man, it just kind of took off her fingerprints. She, oh, wow. You know, when she does fingerprint stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's wild. She worked, she worked hard. Yeah. Um, any pets growing up? I had a dog named Benji. My dad said it would get killed. It got ran over by the school bus. I was sad. He's like, get over it. You know, it's life. Things die. What kind of dog was it? It looked just like Benji. I don't know what that dog is. Oh, it's like a mutt. A mutt, yeah. shaggy, yeah. Yeah. Showed up on our porch one uh, day. Did you play any sports growing up? Man, I was pretty unathletic. My, uh, the, my parents actually uh, went to my school and begged my coach to play me in football. Oh, really? And, and yeah, six-man football in Last Buddy, Texas. We had like 17 people in our high school. Uh, I never made it to high school. I was in junior high. And my parents came down to school – and, uh, you know, they, they asked the, the coach, they said, you know, coach, just play Jimmy one time on the football team. He said, ma'am, I will get fired if I play little Jimmy just one time. That's how terrible I was. <laughs> and I, you know, but I had that honey badger lion heart, you know. Yeah. Were you a uh, uh, small kid growing I, up? I was small as a kid. I, I was six foot one, but like 130 pounds, oh, you know, wow. till, yeah. till I was 18. Like, yeah. just had a hard time putting on muscle. Didn't care about athletics at all. Yeah. I, I didn't see any point in football. Thought thought it was pointless and useless. Um, didn't understand basketball. Uh, hated running, but I knew it was something I, I had to do yeah. uh, for for the SEALs later on because yeah. I knew I wanted to be a SEAL, you know. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of student were you? Uh, I was a terrible student. Uh, once again, because I was questioning everything, yeah. you know, it's I could make the grades if I just applied myself. But I was just sit there in school and I can remember um, just asking the math teacher like, well, but why is it like this? Like, 
why do we got to do this? And I, you know, obviously I had ADHD, ADD back in the day. They didn't, they didn't know how to diagnose it. They didn't really have the medication they do now. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I would find myself staring out the window, looking at the trees, just, just desperate to go back outside and play. I just want to go play army, yeah. you know? Um, did you get into any significant trouble in high school? Yeah, I did. I, I, I didn't make it to high school, but in junior high, I had the record of detention. I, I literally had 99 days. I begged them for one more day just to make it 100, kind of to, in spite <laughs> of the system, you know, going against the system. Yeah. And uh, they wouldn't give me that extra day. That was their punishment. That's how you know, that's how you know it's so bad when you're in trouble yeah. so bad is when they won't give you that 100 days yeah. and you're begging for it. You know? So you, uh, you made it through junior high. You didn't go to high school? Yeah, I didn't go to high school. Parents actually took me out of school when I was uh, 14. What, uh, what was that all about? I, I just was kind of questioning everything and kind of wild. And, and I always thought, you know, if I was in a bigger school, then I probably would have blended in with everybody. Because, I, I know, man, there's some wild, wild, buck wild kids nowadays, you know. Uh, and I wasn't that wild. I wasn't doing drugs in the bathroom and doing this. I just didn't see any purpose for school. Hated it. Wanted to get out as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. I already had my, my goal set already knew I wanted to be a SEAL. If I couldn't be a SEAL, I was going to be a Marine, and that's what happened. Uh, and it just took me a longer ride. And so, man, I, I just was a wild child, you know, and um, just kind of kind of stuck up for my buddies. You were, you, know. were you homeschooled? Not homeschooled, no. So, no. How, I mean, what uh, from the time they pulled you out at 14, did they, I mean, did they say, hey, we're pulling you out and here's why, or did they just take you out and not fucking talk about it? Or I mean, how did that go down? My, my dad got so tired of seeing me getting in trouble. Get, you know, that's when they used to beat you, you know, in school was with SWATs. Yeah. And I had a, so many SWATs, 99 days in detention, eating peanut butter and jelly every day when all the other kids were out playing. It's kind of a nightmare for a little kid. And so my parents finally just said, you know what? For some reason, school just ain't for Jimmy. It's just not happening. I mean, this is coming from a guy who had multiple degrees, theology, petroleum technology, all this. And uh, so they, they, they said, Jimmy, we're taking you out of school. And I couldn't agree with them more. I said, great. They took me out of school. And that was a big mistake because my parents tricked me into going to a, like a, a summer camp, Texas Bible Institute. And that place, I was cleaning 400, nearly 400 toilets a day. That's 100 toilets four times a day. Uh, oh, wow. Four times a day, I would clean these toilets. I got to where I could clean it one toilet in about 40, 45 seconds. I took a lot of pride in everything I did. And at least I was working there, you know? And so from the time I was 14 to, to 16, I was in this uh, Texas Bible school in Austin, Texas, cleaning rows and rows and toilets until I got staph infection, boils. The, uh, in that two-year period, I mean, were you going to school there? Yeah, I was working on my GED. They had a little right. GED program for me there, and I was taking, like, uh, different little um, Christian courses and stuff and uh, uh, just living in Austin, Texas in, in this barracks. Was it uh, all boys? It was all men. I mean, I was, I, I was the youngest guy there, yeah. you know, and that's kind of a theme in my life. I was the youngest in my Marine Corps boot camp, was youngest in, in Texas Bible Institute. Was uh were, was there any squirrely shit going on there, or uh, was it pretty above board as far as like abuse or you know any shady shit going on? There, there wasn't any there wasn't any abuse that that I know of. Uh, it's it seemed pretty square, brother. Yeah. You know they they were running a place. Um, they were running that place for inner city kids in Houston, mm -hmm. and they would bring them in by the bus loads, hence the toilets and stuff. But but really, uh. I mean, you could look at it as a way to get a guy to come there and just work his ass off yeah. for days on end. And that's what I did for nine months straight. I, I cleaned toilets, yeah. painted fences, you know? Yeah. Um, so 16, you get staph infection. Yeah, I got, got boils and staph infection, yeah. So what happened? So I finally went home. My parents tricked me into going there for like, what, two they said I was going for two weeks to Austin, Texas, to this summer <laughs> camp. Literally at the end of the t end of the two weeks, it was so bad, so hot, cleaning these toilets. I said, "Mom, it's been two weeks. I'm ready to come home. Come on, come on." And she's like, "Well, that's the thing, son. It's probably best that you stay for their whole course." And I'm like, "Mom, that's nine months. I can't. I can't do that." And so they tricked me. They just didn't come pick me up. They left me there. Yeah. And so I end up staying there. 
it was probably one of the better things that's happened to me because I got my GED. Um, and at 16? Uh, at six, at 15. No shit. I got my GED at 15 wow. while I was there. Yeah. And then in 16, I uh, got out, uh, get, uh, went back home and started going to community college and training uh, for the, uh, to try to go to SEALs. Yeah. Um, so taking one step back, I mean, were you resentful towards your parents for doing that? Like when you came home, was it awkward or did you uh, just water under the bridge and move on? <laughs> I was, I was mad at first brother. Yeah. I, I mean, was, did you ask them what the fuck? And I was pissed, man. I was like, Hey, I was like, how, how could y'all leave me here? You know, cause I was on this little pay phone yeah. and there was this kid like threatening to beat me up. I mean, there's uh, some bullies there and stuff. And, and, uh, my mom is like, hey, son, sorry, you know, you, you need to stay there. And, and I, I probably was so wild that I see why they, they, they did that. It was like a scheme, a trick to get me to stay there. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, of course, I could have hitchhiked <laughs> or ran away. But I just I decided, you know what, I'm just going to grind it out. And by the time that was over, nine months or so, by the time I saw my parents, I was like, hey, guys, I'm reformed. Yeah. You know, so I was like totally like changed, you know. Yeah, yeah. wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's shit. As you guys know, sleep is a huge component to recovery uh, and really all aspects in life. And it's something that a lot of us have struggled with, uh, you know, for a lot of our lives, frankly. Uh, as you know, I've been a, uh, a big proponent of Beam, which is a hot cocoa that, uh, you know, you drink before you go to sleep. And it's helped tremendously in terms of hours of sleep maintained as well as the uh, quality of sleep. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, which is their science-backed hot cocoa for sleep, and it's got no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. As you know, other sleep aids can cause next-day grogginess um, and just make you feel crappy, but Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, and apigenin, also melatonin, to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up feeling refreshed. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash mic drop, all caps, all one word, and use code mic drop, all one word, all caps at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash mic drop and use code mic drop for up to 40% off. You, uh, you got your GED. At, at what point in your childhood were you introduced to the seal teams and what was the catalyst that made you say that's what i want to do yeah so i used to read these books i used to read uh lrps you know long range patrol guys the riverines the the recondo all those old books you know did you read point man by james james pastors watson with the same damn name yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I know. I have. Yeah. I've read all those books, man. I've yeah. read all. When I was little, I would read, read, read all. Just all military type books. All yeah. like like Sniper, Dear Mom, Carlos Hathcock, all those books. And so, um, I just kind of fantasized about that, and um, and I really wanted to do something like that. And it evolved into. You know, my dad used to sing that song to me as a little kid. For some weird reason, he used to sing that song. Um, the, the Green Beret song, you know, yeah. only three will test today yeah. and only one will, you know, win the Bray or the, the yeah. wings. Yeah. And so I looked at my Green Berets was going to be the SEALs. Yeah. And so when I was probably eight years old at a family reunion, one of my aunts came up and said, hey, little Jimmy, what do you want to do when you're, you're older? I said, I want to be a SEAL. Wow. So they didn't really know where I got all that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, all right, so get your GED, you're going to community college, you're working out training. At what point did you get told and re or realize that you couldn't be a SEAL and decided to go to the Marine Corps first? Yeah, there was no way I was going to be a SEAL at 17 years old or 16. And uh, I, was, I, was pretty, uh, was, I was a realist with all my training and stuff. I was very realistic with my life. And I thought, you know what? So I'm training my, my ass off right now. And I see that I do the PST scores and I see that I'm just failing everything and I'm like stopping on the run. It's pretty embarrassing. I have my dad time, my dad, my faithful dad out there, he, you know, timing me. And he's like, son, this is, you know, you know, maybe one day, right? <laughs> and I was so mad. I can remember almost crying because I was just so frustrated because yeah. I didn't have what it took physically, right? I just, I needed time to mature. And so once I failed those scores at 16, 
and I knew that my ASVAB was like a 17. I mean, man, my ASVAB, <laughs> I mean, you got to remember. No Mike, shit, 17. My, Mike, I was like 17, and my ASVAB score was my age. That's, yeah, that's how brutal, you know man. I was brutal, bro. Yeah. Like, and it's so, because I had no formal school, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, zero. Like, I was not paying attention. And so, you know, uh, uh, ended up, uh, fell in that class, fell in the ASVAB, and I was like, dang, you know, will anybody take me? And the Marine Corps is like, come on in, yeah, son. ASVAB waiver, we'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, so, even, uh, so at my age, yeah. at my age, with all the failures with with the with the seventeen on the ASVAB, you know, and all this crap against me, the Marines is like, look, if your parents sign you in, Jimmy, if you um, if you got the GED, what you do, if you if you get seventeen credits or eighteen credits of college, then you can come in. And I'm like, no, no, you know, you know, it's a curse. The college is a curse, you know, and school is a curse. And so, uh, my dad's like, I got an idea. Jimmy, go to the community college. I'm, I'm like 16, going to Clovis Community College in New Mexico. Go to the community college, take 17 or 18 one credit courses like volleyball, water aerobics, you know, aquatic <laughs> fitness, CPR, yeah. you know, a bowling was one of them. And so I, I all day I went to one of these one credit courses for all day for a whole semester, got my 17 one credit courses. And with that, with the GED, with my parents signing me in, I was off. Yeah, wow. You know, to the Marine Corps. And where uh, where did you go to boot camp? MCRD. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Marine Corps recruit. Did you come in as an infantry guy or what? Uh, 0311. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you go through boot camp. Yep. Uh, how was that overall? I mean, was it a, a wake up call? Did you do fairly well? What What was your experience like? Yeah. So you know, I thought I thought you know what. Um, there's no way they can touch me. There's no way they can touch me. They're not going to hurt me. They can yell all they want. They can scream like these fake boot camps you see on TV now, all these things. But, you know, they're not going to touch me, right? I get there. The first thing they do is just start throwing our stuff across these shiny floors in the barracks, man, that overlook in the grinder at MCRD with the palm trees. And they're just tossing our stuff. I mean, they just scream. And you're like, there's no way they can scream like this for three months straight. No way, right? Big mistake there. They <laughs> scream the entire freaking time. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the first thing they asked, they asked the class, they said, um, um, they said uh, who's the youngest guy in here? And I was like, stupid. I just raised my hand because I knew I was, you know, at barely seven, barely 17 years old in 99, uh, 98, 99. And I raised my hand. He walked over there and socked me as hard as he could in the, in the stomach right here, really? like this, like, bah, bam. And I, I flew over my, my locker, like flew, because I was, I was small. And I flew over my locker and he yelled at me, said something, spit on me, and just kept walking. And I was like, Dang, <laughs> this guy just socked me in the stomach, yeah. and man, I was checked from that moment on. Yeah, I was like, "This is this is no joke." Yeah, wow. Um, so you, you make it through boot camp, uh, you go through infantry training. Uh, what was your your overall experience in the Marine Corps like? How would you characterize it? I, I love the traditions of the Marine Corps. One thing they pounded on was like chesty polar, you know, take me to the brig. I want to see the real Marines, you know. Uh, we're surrounded by, you know, good. We're surrounded on all sides, all that stuff. You know, throwing yourself on the barbed wire, letting your buddies run across you, you know, jumping on the grenade. I just, I, I, I love that stuff, you know, because I was like, this is, this is who I want to be. I want to be part of something. Yeah. It was really validating for me, especially coming from, a background of being bullied, kind of beat up, having to fight back, but your punches aren't landing right. They're not, they don't have power because you're a buck 40, you know, six foot. And so, uh, but my overall experience was really good. They, <clears throat> they didn't feed you in, in Marine Corps uh, boot camp. The, the overall treatment was bad. And, and so I, I just didn't see uh, me making a career out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, but I had a good time, man. Deployed over there a couple times. Got to see some really radical stuff for being so young. The USS Cole bombing. Really? Recover yeah, recovering the bodies there. Shit, I was there at the same time then. Really? Yeah. In Yemen. Yeah. The Gulf of Aden. Yeah, so we... Uh, Dang. 
basically when it happened, we were in Bahrain on deployment and uh, with SEAL Team 3, and uh, it happened. We jumped on the Tarawa, hauled ass down there, and then from sundown to sun up, we guarded it from being attacked again. And, and I don't know if it was you or a, a different group, but the, there were Marine, I think they were fast guys, maybe, I don't remember. Uh-huh. But there was a contingent of Marine forces that basically they watched from sun up to sundown, and we did sundown to sun up for like, 63 days straight. yeah i was there with you i was on the tarawa dude that's the fucking uss nuts, tarawa man. brother dude what are the odds man we, we were all, we were on the tarawa together then that's uh, a fucking trip yeah and the in when in the remember the coal got hit yeah. boom and then we took a a 90 degree turn and went straight to the gulf of aden yeah. with seal team three yeah uh and a fast company was deployed from Bahrain, i believe uh and then our unit uh, attached with uh, the snipers and H H H and S company, we're doing the patrols around uh, the coal, yeah. and then dude, what a fucking small yeah, world, huh? Taking yeah. the bodies to the shore, and that was my first oh. experience, man. Doing the same uh, same shit, and uh, here we are, fucking twenty plus years. It's crazy, later. man. It's wild, small crazy. world, man. Yeah, small world. Um, where were you stationed out of uh, during that four year period? I was in Camp Horno. It means I think that's Spanish for oven, brother. It's in a basin. You know, and it's right near where they did Heartbreak Ridge and all that. Uh, and it's got, you know, that's where the first Marine, I was in first Marines, first Marine division and uh, one, one and three, one. And uh, the tradition, I just love the tradition of the Marines. Yeah. There's something about it that drives you, you know, and, and it helps you out in life with discipline and all kinds of, and if it wasn't for the Marines, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here right now with you because I needed those younger years in my uh, teens and early 20s to burn off and mature yeah. and understand how life really was right yeah so uh was that your first deployment to the coal when the coal thing that happened? was my first deployment i was on the uss tarwa for seven months yeah uh and that that happened and then i believe as a direct result of the coal you know what a year later 9 11 happens yeah by um theoretically the same thugs yeah and so um I had just got back to Camp Porno, California, and I was just glad to be off the tarwood, brother. Just glad yeah. to be off the, you know, you're standing in chow hall lines every day, you know, four times a day. And when I got back to Camp Porno, the, they told us we were deploying again, me and a couple of my buddies. They just put us right back on another rotation, which they're supposed to give you time off. And I was pissed off about that. And I was even more angry because, you know, I joined to go to war, you know, but there wasn't any wars going on. And, of course, my mindset has shifted yeah. now, right? It ain't like that anymore. Like, war as hell. But, you know, at, at, you know, I wanted to get some, right? And I knew that there's nothing happening. The USS Cole thing happened. We didn't do nothing about it. And so I come home, and then all of a sudden they put us on the – I find myself on another deployment with the USS Peleliu now. And that's when 9-11 happened. So you were on deployment when 9-11 happened? I was on deployment. Wow. We had just – came out of Australia on that Westpac and we had just been training with Australians and I was drinking and, and midnight we saw the TV some airplanes in the buildings I thought it was some fake show and then we saw the shore patrol running up and down the streets you know yanking Marines like some kind of movie you know get back on the ship get back on the ship and man we went back to that ship and it was breakout for war yeah did you guys uh go anywhere to respond, like, did you head up towards the Gulf, or what? Uh, what did you guys do? Yeah, we immediately, um, as they're trying to discover who did it, right? Yeah. Bush, we're already out. We're already going to Pakistan, and so we were deployed into Pakistan in the middle of the night. And uh, my company, Charlie Company, uh, took down the airfield, secured the airfield in Pakistan. Um, they had some big riots and stuff going on. They didn't. They didn't like us there, right? Mm. And uh, we secured that little airfield in Pakistan while Bush is talking about who did it, you know, who yeah. is it? And uh, the reason why we secured that airstrip in Pakistan for the sole reason to forward stage uh, pararescue, right? So that they could, uh, they could deploy from there and rescue any down pilots as they uh, initiated the, um, the first objective to just bombed the, the hell out of Afghanistan. Yeah, wow. Did you guys meet any resistance on the uh, airfield, or was it pretty smooth sailing? 
No, it was kind of worrisome because you know, you know, we're just we're just we're Marines, right? You know, we we know one thing that's like, hey, man, kill, right? And so we're they had us dig holes. The first thing they had was dig holes, but we were so spread out, so thin, we were obviously way too small to be um, securing a, ma- a a large airfield like that. And so it was really swampish kind of in Pakistan. And, and we dug our holes. And the first thing, of course, the Marine Corps handbook says, dig a grenade sump in the hole. And so I'm like, grenade sump. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, we dig our hole, our square hole, and everything's fine. It's dry. Mosquitoes around, humid, humid weather. And we want to dig in quick in case we find resistance, right? Because they're pissed off. They're surprised that we're there in Pakistan, yeah. taking over their airfield. You know, we came in in 53s hot and just offloaded a whole company of Marines with heavy machine guns, 240s, all that stuff. And so we're spread real thin. We run some calm lines to the holes. Um, I dig this uh, big hole with a couple other Marines, right? And, uh, and I'm a team leader at the time. And I'm like, dig this right, you know, the right dimensions. You know, the Marine Corps is crazy about this stuff. And uh, I go, you know what? We need a grenade something because if we get over RAM and a grenade comes in your hole, you need a place to kick that thing. You know, kick it real quick into a, a separate little hole, a tunnel, right? And so I dug this, this, this tunnel in our hole, big mistake. And uh, oh, I, 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 I dug this hole out like this round you know, at an angle so we could roll grenades in there and they would blow off a grenade some. And I stuck my hand all the way down that hole in, in the in the hole and I felt water. I heard bloop, 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 bloop. And, I, and water came up to here. Damn. I said, oh man. And so overnight, our hole filled with water. And of course, in the Marines, you ain't digging no other hole. You know, company <laughs> gun, he's not coming over saying, oh, sorry, guys. No, you're spreading that deet all over your face. Yeah. And then you're, you're going to sleep in that hole. You're going to eat in that hole. So for 10 days straight, we were up in the water like this. Man. In a hole, man. Uh, we tried to sleep on the outside of the hole. And then, but it was nasty, man. I mean, that, that had to have fucked you up being in water for 10 days. Yeah, 10 days of water, man, like in, in and out. And during the day, during that, when we when we could, we would uh, sleep on the outside of the hole, but we had to stand in that water like all the time. Yeah. I remember a SEAL team, maybe it was three or five, came by, and they were doing kind of a, a little patrol, probably probably doing a shake out of their gear in Pakistan there, and they were like, "Dang man, you guys could be SEALs any day." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, you know, validation." Yeah, you know. So, uh, any troops in contact? Any firefights that no. didn't go down? No, no zero. No. Uh, was that the the gist of that deployment, or did you do more than that? Uh, do, do, we did more than that. Uh, we packed up our bags after about 10, 12 days in Pakistan. I think some grenades came over the fence and stuff. Nothing big, though, you know, but it was kind of scary because we there was like 5,000 riders on yeah. the outside of the, the barriers. And you, you think about 5,000 guys, yeah. and you're, you're – you're, 100 yards between the holes with other guys i mean you could get screwed so we pack up there and we and i i guess another team uh landed and and relieved us and then we went we started training to go right into afghanistan and we were probably i was probably the the sixth or seventh dude as far as in the marine corps off that 53 in afghanistan right after 9 11 of course the rangers beat us there but yeah was the uh, reception in Afghanistan uh, underwhelming, or did you guys get into anything in Afghanistan? It was it was pretty underwhelming. You know, it wasn't like uh, the initial invasion of Iraq or anything like that. Um, it was pretty barren land south of Kandahar. Yeah. The first objective we took out was uh, was Camp Rhino, and so it was a it was a supposed it was a drug compound for heroin runs, uh, an airstrip there, and. Um, Man, my only job was to go through this gate, um, and uh, and then and then just basically blast any anybody that was there, like the Taliban, whatever. You know, in fact, we had a seal give us our ROAs. He was like, mm. "Destroy everything," <laughs> and you know, it's just it's you, this is kind of mind blowing now. Yeah. But after nine eleven, if you remember, brother, it's like after nine eleven, we were thinking we were going to war for four years. Yeah, you know, we're training harder than ever. We're unleashing the beast, all the ammo, all the RPGs, all the stuff from the underbelly of that big uh, ship, yeah. the Pelu. They're carrying all kinds of armament, armament. And so when, when we landed in Afghanistan, I remember how cold it was, how unprepared we were without warming layers. 
And it was just, I thought we were going to be the next Frozen Chosen going up in there. Because that was our unit. Our old unit was the Frozen Chosen, the first Marines, you know. Hard dudes. And so we land in Afghanistan. And there's this big drug compound there. But it's just shot. It's just shot up. A, a, a gunship did a run on there. And uh, a C-130 gunship, AC-130. And, man, it just destroyed. There was no gate to go through. I mean, it was just blasted around. It was blasted down. I assume heroin? Heroin drug compound yeah. that they were doing runs out of. Yeah. And then we started forward patrolling from there. Um, and we were there for a while. And then uh, with, you know, landmines go off, hurt some guys, sporadic gun battles here and there, but nothing like I would see later on. Yeah. You know? Um, was there heroin in that uh, no. compound? No. It was no. empty. Yeah. No, not that I know of. I, I didn't see anything. Yeah. Um, did that wrap up that deployment, or was there more to it than that? Brother, we thought we were going to be there for a long time. And during that time of the year in Afghanistan, you the sun was just like a four-hour day. The sun would just kind of go like this on the horizon. Yeah. And, you know, the nights were just cold, yeah. and we couldn't have fires, no real warming gear, a little bitty, the thin little sleeping bag. And I just remember being freezing for yeah. that time there, man. Oh, I bet. No showers, one MRE a day, about one jug of water a day. They were rationing off for us. And so it was like the real deal, man. How long were you in that environment from the time you touched down in Pakistan and took the airfield over until you left? Uh, from the time in Pakistan, 10 days, and then Afghanistan, 40 days. 40 days, wow. And there you go. So almost almost two months or basically two months total yep, seven yeah. eight months total on deployment yeah. i mean we were we were in afghanistan longer than that but without a shower and stuff yeah. south of kandahar and in camp rhino yeah 40 days yeah yeah um so that deployment wraps up you end up coming home and did you get out of the the marines shortly thereafter or what was the yeah, the, the transition to go over into the navy yeah so so man my goal i mean i, I saw force recon um training we i was in a security platoon it was kind of it wasn't as sexy as it it it, it sounded at the time but you know because we still had the ma2 uh m16s you know and uh but we were doing vbss gas gas oil platform so it was like a little taste of yeah. what the seals do and so I, I i really liked that we were the trailer platoon for force you know kind of the security for them and um and I remember the Force Recon coming by and saying, hey, does anybody want to come on over here and try it out? And I was like, no, nah, you know, I was like, no, nah, my 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 end destination is the SEALs. You know, I had that vision. I had that goal in mind. And it was going to be a long journey to get there. I got out of the Marine Corps and, um, and started studying for that ASVAB, started training hard again like always and i was i was more i was physically mature now right but i still needed that uh intellectual ability you know and and the aptitude for it and so i studied hard for that and went in and took the asvab again and this time it went from a 17 to like a 48 and i was like <laughs> no you know um, you know it was like dang and so uh, went to Amarillo and, and took this test. And, you know, you got to have like a 50 on the ASVAB to, to uh, they, the, you know, the minimum, minimum score of 50. And so I take this test and I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm desperate for this. I, I want the SEALs, but my ASVAB score is just creeping up over the years. And so this time I come in, I make a 48, and they're like, uh, this old lady is 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 mark is marking all this red on the test and i'm like no 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 and she marks it 48 she goes i can give you one point to a 49 i begged this lady i said <laughs> lady please i said give me a 50 please and she's like i'm sorry son and i was like you don't know what this means to me you know please and she's like i'm sorry and so i was like dang and so i'm walking out of the of the asfab and this guy with the green beret with all these medals on his chest you know, he's jacked, he's standing there, and he grabs me as I'm walking out. And I'm like, what, man? I was pissed off, Mike. I was, I was always pissed off and because and, and I, I wanted to do that. You know, it was a goal of mine. And uh, the Green Beret said, hey, it's not your day today, but maybe tomorrow it is. And I said, I don't know about that anymore, man. I was discouraged, Mike, you know. And he's like, hey, pick your head up. Like, stop being a bitch, you know. 
And he was like, he's like, I, I know, I know something you might want to do. And I was like, man, I don't know. And he's like, hey, listen, uh, why don't you look into Blackwater? It just started up. They're pretty brand new. Have you ever heard of them? I said, I think so. You know, because I was always looking at, uh, you know, anti-poaching patrols in South yeah. Africa, you know, soldier of fortune <clears throat> magazines. I want to do something crazy, right? Yeah. Underwater welder. I don't know. Whatever. And so uh, he goes, go check them out. You know, put in your, your application with them and see what happens, man. You'll go overseas, do all this stuff. And so that's what I did. I went home. I applied for Blackwater. Um, they picked me up and uh, went straight there, straight to the vetting process. Wow. So, I mean, that's a kind of a reverse path than what most guys, they go to the SEAL teams for a period of time and then do <laughs> yeah. Blackwater afterwards. You went to Blackwater and, and yeah. then. So yeah. uh, what was your first experience with them, you know, once coming on board? What, what was uh, the, kind of the first gig that you did for them? Man, I, I went straight to, from the vetting process in Moy North, Moyock, North Carolina, straight to Baghdad, Iraq. I didn't oh. go home or nothing. Straight from Virginia to, to, to Baghdad, or to, for, to Jordan. Flew straight into Baghdad, Iraq, man, and it was a whole new level. Like, I, I landed there as soon as we landed in the La Casa, this twin-engine La Casa. Uh, I remember you know, mortars hitting off in the distance. And me and this other guy, he had a tattoo around his neck saying, cut here with me. <laughs> Straight up, gee, you know. What the and fuck? I, yeah, yeah. He had, a, he had a literally a pair of, like, looked like half scissors right here. Yeah, and the and, dotted line. And dotted line all around his neck said, cut here. Tattoos everywhere. Man. And this is my swim buddy, you know. I'm like, dude, it's over. I was like, what have I done? What you know? was his background? Man, he, I, he was a, I think he was, what was he, a ranger or a marine? He was a ranger or a marine. Yeah. Might have been a marine. Crazy story about this guy. Yeah. Me and him go to the team, go, go right to the man camp in Baghdad, Iraq. And, you know, we go through the six-mile death road, you know, route Irish, uh, get inside, and they're just like, keep down, you know, shut up, you know, don't say anything. We get out of the vehicle, all right? I get out first. He gets out second out of this up-armored cage, that they had with these SUVs. It was really rogue back in the day. This is right when Blackwater started. I get out, he gets out. And there was some team leader there from Blackwater, and he was like, hey, you, you're staying in Baghdad? You, you're going to Mosul. Uh, pack your bags, you're going to Mosul tomorrow. And I was like, hey, bro, see you later, man, because we got drunk the night before and Jordan talking about his tattoo on his nag, you know. This guy goes to Mosul the next day. Um, like two days later, um, this guy is put in the trunk monkey in the back of the SUV. They tell him, sit down, shut up. They get hit by an ID with a follow on attack. He gets blown out the back. Everyone dies in his SUV. Everyone dies. He gets blown out the back. He wakes up in the middle of the, 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 the street in Missoula and smokes everywhere. The, the vehicle's on fire. He's, got a massive wound right there in his in his neck. Wow. He's holding his neck like this, ruined his speaking ability. His trach, he got a trach and all kinds of stuff, really messed him up for the rest of his life. But he sat there, hold it like this, and he said he, he kind of looked, and, and he said he saw these insurgents running up on him, the follow-on attack. And so he reached down, and, and, and he looked, and he saw his weapon, and he grabbed it, and it was just melting his skin off. Like it was just hot and ruined. Yeah. And, uh, and so he crawls back to the back of the truck that's burning with four guys dead, gone. Uh, they couldn't even find one guy for a long time. He was like up in the, underneath the carriage, big, big dude. And uh, he goes to the back of the, the uh, truck and uh, finds an AK, a loose AK, turns around and smokes a couple of the guys. They, they're like shocked. They run, skedaddle. He's, he kind of saves the day. Everybody's dead in that truck. Um, they air flight him out of there, but it was kind of crazy how he got hit right in his neck where his tattoo was. Yeah, that's fucking wild. Were there other vehicles? Yeah, there was a couple other vehicles. Okay. I don't, I don't know the whole story behind it, but that's what happened with him and his truck. Yeah. That would have been you then if it had gone the other way around, probably. 50, 50 man yeah. survival, man. Yeah. I, I call oh. it. Yeah. Um, so that was what, 2004 when you showed up there? That was 2004. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, 
Blackwater for four years. The initial, you know, when you when you land, um, you know, hearing that story is pretty wild. What uh, what were you there to do? Like, what was the mission statement as far as your job title is concerned? And, and tell us about your time at Blackwater. So yeah, I think a lot of people get it mixed up what what a, what a mercenary is and what a contractor is. You know, Blackwater was you're a contractor because you're in a defense position. Uh, for the diplomatic diplomatic uh, State Department mission, right? Uh, you know, uh, taking uh, diplomats out, Condoleezza Rice, the undersecretaries, Dick Cheney, uh, all these, all, and all, all the strap hangers, right? And basically, you're taking them out to go get coffee and have a meeting, but you're risking an entire team of former uh, team guys or Marines or Rangers, what have you, you know, that, that are now GS-13s with black diplomatic passports because that's yeah. what they gave us. And so now you're taking them out to go get coffee, and dudes are dying all the time. You know, just as many dudes died in Blackwater as did um, in, in contracting in general, Cochise, all these uh, Dynacor, Triple Canopy, as did the uh, regular service members. Oh, wow. And um, – and so the same amount of guys died, the same amount of guys got wo- injured and wounded, if not more, uh, because they really utilized us in an offensive manner. We still weren't mercenaries. I did mercenary work later on in my life. And that's, you know, obviously for other governments and more of a direct action type thing, right? But uh, Blackwater, we were there in support of the diplomatic uh, Department of State uh, mission, Right for the ambassador's detail, drug charge uh, ministers and stuff like that, and so I got there, and I decided, man, I'm all in. All right, uh, maybe seals will happen one day, maybe it won't, but I'm all in, and this is an opportunity like none other. You know, this hasn't happened in America where they're using a black water type group, Dynacor Triple Canopy, for for years and years, maybe a hundred so years, right, and so. They utilized these guys to do this mission. I got there. I was going to soak up every single position. I didn't care where they put me. If they sent me to Mosul with that guy and got blown out the side, that was going to be my destiny, right? And so I just started hitting every mission, every, every single thing they told me to do. And so at first, they they just gave me a squad automatic weapon, you know, saw with the nut sack on it, sawed off, you know, parasol, they call it, uh, with an EOTech on it. It looked cool as hell, you know. Yeah. They gave that to me. Uh, I was a bigger guy. They called me Haas, H-A-U-S. You know, they gave me that name. It wasn't Twinkle Toes. So I was <laughs> glad about that. I was like, I'll take Haas over Twinkle Toes any day because you never want to name yourself. Like, my name's Chainsaw. No, now your name is Twinkle Toes because you decided to take it upon yourself to name yourself. And so I took the name uh, on Haas, you know, and at the time it was called Templar, the Templar Knights, the teams, Templar. Then they changed it to Raven to be more uh, politically savvy, you know. And so I went to Team 10. I went to, I went to a bunch of teams there, 26, 23, the QRF teams. I worked my way through the whole deal uh, from uh, driver to uh, agent in charge uh, to tactical commander to left and right door gunner. And at the time, it was the wild, wild west, man. You know, we would get in shoots all the time. And uh, it was always two military aged men, ride it on the back of an MRE card, turn it into the Department of State. They don't know what you're talking about. You know, you were in fear for your life. That was the that was your ROEs. You know, is my life in danger? Is my team member's life in danger? Or is the the team gear and property in danger? If it was and you felt justified, then you took a shot, you know? There were really no warning shots. They were very specific about that. So it really forced you into a a very difficult decision. Like, do I shoot this guy or is he just a bad driver? Yeah. You know, or is his car, you know, going to vaporize my team because of my neglect and my cowardice not to shoot? And so it's like getting in a in a in a firefight in downtown New York at a super Walmart parking lot you know you give a guys a bunch of belt fed machine guns you know ex-operators you send them to iraq you know you start getting shot at from insurgents in a in a super walmart parking lot and people are going to die like it's it's whether it's from you or from them or them hiding behind crowds and stuff it happens um and so it's a very very difficult situation 
a lot of snipers taking pot shots at you all the time. And so you were constantly uh, in danger when you were going out in the red zone. And then when you came back from the green, to the green zone, uh, we were brand new. And Eric Prince started prod, prodding and probing us to, to start taking more proactive roles, you know? And so, and I think our, our project manager at the time was Danny Carroll. Love that guy, SEAL guy, like yeah. a legendary. He was a project manager, and he'd always be like, Jimmy, you know there's going to be enemy out there, you know? And, you know, and so uh, it was a Wild Wild West. And, and uh, so we started doing probably eight missions a day. Wow. And, um, uh, and it was crazy, you know? The stuff that I saw there was like nothing I had seen in the Marines and, 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 um, and elsewhere. And uh, started doing the turret gunner position, which was extremely dangerous. Um, you're not like the army where they're covered up to here, even though that's dangerous. You know, one of those Blackwater trucks, those Mambas, um, you were just up to here, your belly button sticking out. You know, you got a little plate hanger right here. We didn't even have ear pro at the time or helmets for a long time. Uh, eventually went up to their red cell and started, uh, I became a team leader there in charge of 30, uh, 30 guys in an assault team and a quick reaction force, you know, and uh, it started running and gunning. And uh, they liked how I, how I did the missions. I understood what worked and what didn't work. I understood what the men wanted. Uh, a lot of team leaders would hang back kind of cowardly. I felt like it was being cowards, man. When there was a, a team in, in jeopardy out there in the uh, red zone, whether that be an army team, a national guard team, getting uh, overran. Uh, we, we, we went to firefights like that where they were literally getting overran when we got there. And so we became the 911 force, Blackwater, of, uh, of Iraq. Whether you be a Marine, Army team, Air Force, it didn't matter. Another contracting team, if you were in danger, Blackwater didn't operate under the same rules as the military. And so it's hard sometimes for some military, and I've got a lot of criticism over that. Well, man, you, you, know, you shouldn't have gone out in the Nisar Square, you know, you disobeyed orders. There was no orders to obey or disobey. Mine were the orders, you know. You're at the top of the chain when you're a team leader there. You have a couple guys in administrative positions in air-conditioned rooms back in the rear with the gear, but it was all on you. You know, we didn't have the overhead, you know, looking down on us, the nine layers. And so it was all up to us to make serious life and death calls every day, and we were making them. Yeah. Uh, you did that for four years. Four years, yeah. And for that entire four years, were you just going back and forth to Iraq the whole time? Back and forth to Iraq the whole, the whole time. Um, uh, but at some point, I think it was in 2006, I briefly went over to Kabul, Afghanistan to start up a couple teams there. Okay. Uh, can you, do you Have you kept track of how many months or years in, the, in that four-year period? How much of that four years did you spend in Iraq and Man, Afghanistan? I, so you know how everybody counts deployments differently. I did 20 <laughs> combat deployments, and they were two months long, you know, or where a Marine will say, oh, I did two deployments, and his was 14 months straight each time, you know, yeah. and the longer you're there, the more chances you, you get killed, right? And so I would say that I have maybe 13, 14 uh, actual deployments total, uh, you know, nine months on uh, a month back, go to Vegas, spend a bunch of money, because you think you're a baller, you know, you're not, but you think you're a baller after yeah. nine months of $500 to a thousand a day. And so, uh, but, but four years total, nine months on, and that's a long stretch. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, most of the time, most of that four years you were in Iraq. Yeah. It was my permanent mailing address. Yeah. Iraq, right. Wow. Yeah. Um, obviously you got into a shitload of firefights and, uh, and gun battles in that four year period, um, for the sake of not spending two full days on an interview with all the other stuff that you've done. Uh, and for the sake of brevity, can you share a, a couple of them that stand out as being exceptionally memorable? Yeah. Uh, there was one that w we called gray five, five, cause we were always calling them by their gray codes, you know, uh, and what is a gray code, a gray code was just a, um, a designation marker on the map that we use. Like we were traveling the black, uh, routes, the solder city routes that, that army couldn't travel and stuff. And so we could get there quickly. Right. So we had all these gray codes and, and so we knew them as gray five, six, gray five, five firefight, you know, and we numbered them like that. But gray five, five was another traffic circle. Be just like Nisar square was a traffic circle. Everybody thinks, well, why is a traffic circle? Well, because that's the point 
where they attack you because you're slowing down, you're turning, you're having to stop in the traffic. And it's an excellent roundabout situation where they can basically circle the wagons and hit, hit you like fish in a bowl, right? And so grade five, five, um, the, uh, we were supposed to be off that day in my quick reaction force team. And uh, I was a turret gunner, a lead turret gunner in, in that time. And the day before, you know, a little voice in my head said, Jimmy, you better clean that 240 machine gun. And I had it cleaned it in a few days. It was nasty. The dirt and, and muck in Iraq was getting it all, the guts of it all messed up. But this little voice kept telling me, you better clean that. And I was like, nah, get off me. You know, the next day I have off. I have the next day off. No big deal. All the guys wanted me to come out in the man camp and party, drink with them, and uh, eat pizza, right, like we would do around a big campfire. And this little voice kept telling me to go clean that weapon. And so, man, I got up. I was hot. We had just done a bunch of runs that day. I was tired. We had the day off the next day. But I listened to that little voice. And I went out. And I grabbed that 240, slugged on my shoulders, walked a mile and a half over to this big cleaning vat, cleaned the weapon for like an hour in this heated, it was so hot in Iraq, you know, you're sipping your canteens like coffee, it's so hot, and uh, cleaned this 240 uh, machine gun, uh, super clean, everybody's kind of laughing like, Hoss, what are you doing cleaning that weapon? We got tomorrow off, you know, we got tomorrow off. I was like, I don't know, man, I just had that weird feeling, right? The very next day, we got drunk that night. You know, I got my weapon nice and clean, you know, for the next couple runs we do in, in the future. The very next day, a National Guard team uh, yelled contact over the radios. And we're always monitor, uh, monitoring our, our radios. And both teams that were supposed to, the primary, secondary team, we're the third team that's off. Both teams were out on other missions. Busy, busy. And so... They say, you know, Raven 2-6, Raven 2-6, Raven 2-6. When they say that, it was on like Donkey Kong. I had a hangover. I was getting an IV from a guy. <laughs> in, and I literally ran out to the truck with the IV in. The needle was like bent. I just kept, You just kind of forget about this stuff. I said, take this thing out. He's an old 18 Delta guy, Army SF guy. He took it out. I was all bruised up. And uh, we jumped in there. You know, we load through the the belly of the the truck, the Mamba, and I and I popped up in the in the in the uh, lead turret gun. I mounted the machine gun. Totally forgot about cleaning it, and this thing was nasty. When I cleaned it, it was just nasty, and it would never work right. And so we start racing out the door. And when you're racing into a battle like that, you know you're thinking in your thoughts. You you know you don't have a lot of time to think, but you know you could you could die in the next few moments, right? But, you know, you're all in. I was all in there in everything I did. And so this National Guard team was getting uh, just pounded. And they said, we're getting overran. We're getting overran. And we heard, heard, heard all this gunfire. And as we're rolling up to this gray 5-5, five five, this traffic circle, all you could see was this black and white smoke. And it was like Star Wars, like these tracers were going back and forth like this. Like, choo, 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 choo. And it was dark and it was sunny outside, but this whole traffic circle was just full of thick black and white smoke. And I can remember being this far out of your turret and the lead turret gunner at the very lead of the vehicles and we're racing into this. And our SOPs were basically to just go straight in there, set up a wall of, a wall of steel, go right in between all the catch, all the gunfire for this team, and just take the full brunt of this fire and deliver hell back. And as we were coming in the in the circle, I remember the only thing I could think of doing was I just got behind that 240, forget the 203 grenade launcher, forget the car, it's all that's garbage right now. And I leaned into that 240, and we're going full speed. It's like I was on an airplane doing a dive bomb mission. <laughs> and I leaned into that 240, didn't even think about me having to clean it the next day. And I'm leaning in, and I, and I see these uh, insurgents walking up point blank on this National Guard team. And these National Guard members, one was a girl. She was trying to stuff herself under. You do some weird, funky stuff when you're getting shot at, you know, they say the buttons on your blouse is, is not enough. You know, you want to press yourself to the ground. And these, this National Guard team had given up and it was over. These insurgents were walking up on them execution style, literally just maybe 
maybe 100 feet from the vehicles, like the movie Heat, you know, yeah. walking right up on them. And they had zero idea that I was coming from the side, our team. And uh, when I saw that, I just lined uh, these insurgents up, and I just I pulled that trigger, man, and a 100-round burst. And I was known for just pulling long bursts. And I just pulled that trigger, and I remember the fire that came out of that 240 and the smoke and the CLP that I had put in there, all that oil just – blew up out of there boom 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 and it just roared and that that thing is a fire breather tires getting t thrown up in the air and it was danger close to that team and i could see that girl trying to squeeze up under that hummer they were terrified they had given up they didn't even have um they did not even have their 50 cows up and running they were unmanned they had abandoned ship and they were just crawling under to die like these school shootings when somebody just gives up right and so uh, I pulled that trigger, and, and one of the guys was tossed. I don't want to glamorize it. I don't want to say, oh, he flew over here and this and crazy, all this stuff. No, it's hell, you know, and a smoke to dump those dudes. And another insurgent, it's like it dawned on him that hell was upon him, and they had got caught from the side. He tried to hide under a vehicle, and I just blew the, the, the car to pieces with the 240. It doesn't blow up like the movies. You know, I don't want anybody to misquote me out there saying, oh, well, you know, 50 cal ran, <laughs> a 50 cal round went right here and it blew him up. No, yeah. it, you know, it didn't even, but um, uh, chewed him up and chewed a bunch of guys up that day. And uh, there was 30 KIA. The Rangers went in wow. and did an assessment afterwards. And it was a bad situation. And we just did that roundabout until everybody, uh, the insurgents were dead. And that was one of the more memorable firefights that I – I couldn't believe that I was um, alive. I had burn marks on me. My buddy had burned his hands trying to change his 240 fire breather out. It was a dual turret right behind me, just breathing down. Here. My, my neck was burnt. Uh, but good times, man. Fuck, man. That's an intense story. I and, mean, I've, I've heard quite a few over the last few <laughs> years on, on this show, and uh, that's fucking right up there with it, man. That's intense. Yeah, it was, it was incredible because, you know, when you're, when you're lining out a, a building – yeah. And, and you're hitting that building with that 240. You know, those tracers, it's like the Grinch who stole Christmas, man. He's lining that, you know, those tracers uh, smack in the middle of those buildings and just it stick there and burn. And it was like Christmas lights all over the buildings. And then when I was out of the, of the 240, you know, any low in the firefight, these guys were embedded in the building firing down upon us. And I had a couple guys tell me, man, I don't know how you're not dead, Jimmy, you know, yeah. because every or Hoss, and because every time I would reload, and that's where that slow is smooth, smooth is fast comes in and all that training. Because, you know, every time I'd reload, you could just hear that bullwhip by your face, you know. Yeah. And the water bottles exploded next to me. You think you're shot because, you know, that hot water from the Baghdad sun. But I didn't get hit. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how, how many vehicles for you guys were there? Four, four up armored trucks with literally thousands and thousands of rounds yeah. in, in the underbelly. And so you guys smoked 30 dudes. 30 dudes accounted for. Who uh, knows how many you hit and yeah, got drug off or whatever. Yeah, and, one of, and a lot of them, a lot of them uh, there were big blood drag marks in the hallway because they were trying to hide and uh, crawl. Some of them were found in, uh, in bathtubs and stuff in, in, because they were, because those HE rounds, you know, we were dumping, dumping those two or three rounds in the windows. And uh, they're little small windows way up there on these on these buildings, but miraculously we were getting them in. I just kept on just kind of boom Kentucky windage boom, and I had a, a canister of thirty grenades right here. And so I just I emptied the entire canister, and you know those you could hear those rounds go through the window. Sometimes they hit on the outside, you miss, but go through and then blow up deep inside that building. When we, when we went past there the next day, we didn't do the assessment. The Rangers did said there was thirty KIA in, insurgents. Um, and when we went through there the next day, the back side of that building, the glass was just completely blown out in a massive pile on the other side. Wow. And the traffic circle was just devastated, man. I bet. Uh, yeah. About how long was that firefight? Do you recall? Um, that firefight, it felt like it was 30 minutes, just pure hell. But I, I bet you it was uh, maybe 15 minutes. Yeah of just pure because we didn't leave we just stopped and just exchanged yeah. and they didn't want to leave they were buckled down 
and we didn't want to leave. Really, <laughs> we didn't want to leave either, man. Yeah, I wanted wow. to say, you know, did uh, did that National Guard team that was being overrun? Did they lose any? Uh, they didn't lose anybody. Wow. We had a guy named Jesus. We, his nickname was Jesus because he looked like like <laughs> Jesus in the picture, you know, and crystal blue eyes, long black hair, and black water, you know. And this guy was just a bullet magnet, you know. <laughs> and this guy, one time, I told him, Mike, I said. Hey, dude, I don't want you on the team because you're a bullet magnet, but I love you, man. And he's like, J you know, Haas, just put me in. Like, put me in, coach, put me in. I said, no, there's no way I'm putting you as a turret gunner. So we put him in the very back. And this guy is we're, – we're flying down the road. No bullets are flying that day, nothing like that. We're going down the uh, – one, one of the roads in Baghdad, and somebody all of a sudden says, Jesus is hit. And I said, <laughs> dude, stop. I said, hey, you guys keep messing around, man. I'm, I'm too stressed out for this, man. Yeah. Like, don't me mess around. They said, no, he's hitting the face. I said, it's not possible. He's in the very back behind, you know, up armored window like this. A round, a, a, a sniper round, a random round that you can't hear. Because you get back and see a hole in the truck. You say, what the heck? Yeah. Some sniper takes a shot. You can't hear it in Baghdad, the, the, the buildings and stuff, and all the noise of the diesel engines. And uh, a sniper round had gone through the skin of the, the top, the top, the weak part of the truck, bounced off one of the walls or, or, or window, and he was staring. He wanted to get some. So he's staring this close uh, out the window, and that round smacked him square in the nose. You know, bounced a couple times, hit him in the nose. He was okay. Got stitched up by a PKM in that big firefight because he tried to get out. He said, put me in. One of the turret gunners got hit in the head on that firefight that I was in, dropped him in the turret. And then this guy we call Jesus, of course, he wants to get some. Yeah. And, and you know, so he tries to come out the side of the up armor vehicle. They tried to stop him because he tried to go in the turret. And the second his leg, <laughs> the second his leg came out of that truck, he got stitched up by a PKM, pop, 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 by up his leg. Of course, he got fly, flown out. Uh, he was always hit. Wow. Did the uh, other turret gunner that got hit in the head, did he die? He didn't die. He wow. it dropped him and uh, mir just miraculous, man. You know, you've heard of these guys that get hit in the helmet yeah. and then kind of wraps around their head, some anomaly, and that's what happened to him. That's crazy. Did the uh, National Guard unit, did you ever see them? Like, did they – Thank you guys. Did you ever meet up with them afterwards? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did. The uh the next day we went to get some I mean it was a major firefight, man. Yeah. And we were so fortunate guys didn't get injured more than they did or killed. And so when we got back, uh we had a ton of cases of beer come our way. And oh, they wow. said it was from the, the National Guard team. Yeah, that's cool. And a lot of them were in the, the hospital getting just checked up. And yeah. so when we, we would drive by the Baghdad Hospital in the green zone uh, to the man camp, and as we were going by there, I'll never forget, they were, they were there. They were just – they were so thankful. And yeah. it, felt, it felt good because yeah. I didn't come to Baghdad to kill people. I didn't come there to be some monster. As a team leader, if you said – if you had any kind of notion about you that I, I want to go kill dudes, I want to go – you know, that you were out of there. Window or I'll seat on, on the airplane. I was, I was highly against that and kind of angry at that because I came there to rescue people, to help people, to save people from the insurgents, this and that. And, um, man, I saw a lot of atrocities over there to kids and stuff and a lot of bad, bad stuff. And so, and so I, I was there to do good. You know, yeah. and uh, and at the time I thought it was serving my country in another capacity, you know, and it's kind of jaded if you think about it. But but that was my mindset. And yeah. uh, that was all the guys mindsets, man. We were there to do good. And so that National Guard team gave us a bunch of pizza, cigarettes and beer. Yeah. We had some a photo op a photo ops with them and stuff at the cross swords. And yeah. so it was a good time. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, you mentioned the atrocities and the mindset. I want to talk about that for a, a quick minute. What's the worst thing that you saw over there? The, the worst thing that I, that I saw is, like, um, they had this uh, they had this Army patrol going by, and there was a, a kid that was dead on the side of the, on the road. And they went and... Uh, to go check this kid out, this Iraqi kid that looked dead on the side of the road, left for some reason. And uh, when they walked up to him, uh, they uh, it was an IED and blew him up, blew killed some guys. And 
what they had done is they had obviously kidnapped a kid, um, put a howitzer in him, on him, however they did it, rigged him with a howitzer, and that was their bait to get the Army Patrol to go and check it out. And I thought that was the about the lowest you can go. Yeah, There's ways to go about war. And I never had animosity towards the enemy because um, I felt like I'm in their backyard. If they were in my backyard, I'd be acting the same way, not not stealing some kid and rigging an IED to it, of course. So I thought I saw a lot of like just really bad stuff like that, you know. That's hard to uh, you know to process and wrap your mind around in, in that environment, or even if you compartmentalize it and you know once you come home address it. But uh, that's fucking savagery you know it's uh that's just brutality on a level it's hard to comprehend um did that impact you at that time or was it just something you're like man that's fucked up and you moved on yeah nothing nothing faced me when i was there yeah. you know and and um and it was weird how it did it and it was just survival you know i was trapped in a vehicle for a while you know, with some some dead bodies and stuff, and you know, because because the handle came off in one of our armored trucks, and we couldn't get these. We were we were rescuing these, um, or we were collecting the bodies up at night in the, in the green zone, as as rockets hit, like pieces of bodies, you know, and they were always they weren't really a lot of times they weren't Americans, but they were their own people, Iraqi workers that were contracted in the green zone, in these random seventy four millimeter rockets or or uh, or uh, mortars would hit them. And so we would go and collect them up and, and stuff, and and uh, and that that didn't phase me. And we would laugh it off, smoke some cigarettes, drink some beer, wash out the truck with all the blood, wash the brains off my my feet because I was in sandals one time and I had to go do it. We had I had to run out the door, and uh, but then years later, man, Mike, when uh, I thought I was hard as nails, man, and even the my seal buddies at the bar, man, when we'd be partying, they said, Jimmy, how 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 can uh, you seem like you're acting normal, man? And, and after all these deployments with Blackwater and Marines and stuff, and I said, man, you know, all that PTSD is for pussies, bro. It's for pussies, it's, and 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 that's just how it is. And um, but all the all the same time, I'm I'm slamming 15 shots of Jack Daniels, and I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, and and drowning my proms. And and I tell you, I went home. I, I had a I had a my penis was crushed in a, in an in an accident crazy kind of funny story if if it would have and it's funny now cuz it turned out okay but um i had to go home to texas to get the a major surgery and um you had to have your dick reconstructed absolutely 100% did they add something to it they they uh i had them reduce it cuz it was so <laughs> ridiculous that's what happened so guys minimizing okay i'm 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 part irish so that's not true yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so yeah, that's a crazy story. We can get it, whatever. Yeah. But, but during that time, my my little, I found out, you know, I texted my brother on Easter and I said, "Dan, what's up, man? You okay? You know, you you because he had been clean for a year, and he said, I'm just trying life, bro. I'm just trying life. That was his last text he ever sent me. There ain't no try in this life, and that's what I that's what I learned from that experience is 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 there ain't no trying. You know, you don't try life. Dan Dan was a tough guy. But he was he had let his vices get a hold of him. And when I had to go, that was the last text I ever got from him. And I had to go after I recovered from my surgery to my mom's house to go clean up uh, because he was he had died in my mom's bed. And he, he wasn't found until like six days later on Easter because I was recovering. And um, when I had when I walked through that door, Mike, uh, this badass, tough, seal blackwater marine all this bravado bullshit you know went out the door when i smelt my own my own little brother i, I, I and when and when that happened uh, a, a trigger went off in my mind and i realized man that i was messed up from the war uh from the deployments lost it somewhere on the night shift whatever you want to call it and i wasn't so tough after all and i was i was on that crazy train, you know, and, and and I was and I was next, and when I when I smelt that and when I had to clean that up, it it that was the beginning of the end for Jimmy Watson, as we know, uh, until I had to get until I had to have a, a life changing experience later down the road, so I went downhill after that, 
you know, I still I was still was a team leader in the, in the teams and, and still operating at a high level, but but I was not okay, man. Yeah. And I was that guy that had major PTSD and stuff. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, so that happened when you were in the SEAL teams. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we can go back to the Blackwater time, um, pretty intense four years, uh, kind of at the height of when things were really rough in Iraq, you know, 04, 08. I mean, that, that window is like epic. The, the varsity time of, of the really, really bad shit uh, or, or at the height of the Iraq war. Um, how, how did your time at Blackwater wrap up and then ultimately transition into the SEAL teams? Yeah, so, so there was a, it's in 2007, it just started getting uh, more ramped up every day. And you could just feel this ominous presence. It wasn't like in 04, 05, 06, where it was like fun and you're drinking beer with your boys and you're like this rogue cowboy type mercenary, whatever you want to call it. It was more like, dude, I'm going to die here probably. Like my, my buddies are getting killed here. You know, guys are randomly just getting smoked in their trailers in the man camp from rockets. Like this is bad. And I could just feel this dark presence kind of around us, you know. And the day I left the turret gun for uh, Team 26, Team uh, Team 26 and the QRF team, they moved me from the turret gun to a team leader uh, for 23 and to, to be in charge of this team. And the day I left, the guy in the same turret gun, a good friend of mine, was blown out uh, by, there was an EFP in a watermelon stand, went through the engine with a follow-on attack. He survived. He, he hit his head. I mean, slammed his head, was in a, in a really bad condition. Another guy got his, his arm blown, blown up real bad, uh, follow-on attack. Uh, but I, I went over and was the team leader of this other team, okay? And, you know, I knew what worked by then. I had been there. I mean, that's a long time if you think about almost four years running every day with, with minimum breaks, you know, to Las Vegas to party and come back. And uh, so I knew what the guys wanted. You know, they wanted they wanted sleep when they could sleep. They wanted, you know, food when they could eat. And they wanted the sled dogs want to work, you know. And I and I I wanted to utilize what we had for the best. I wanted to go save teams, save National Guard teams, save other people, and, and come back home alive, right? And uh, and to be honest, it wasn't even about the pay, you know. At that point, it was more about just doing something that was exciting in life and, and that was meaningful and felt worthy at the time, but it was hell. And uh, so a couple of days before the Nisar Square, this massive, massive event that would turn my life into pieces, um, uh, it was ramping up. Guys were getting injured all over. The firefights seemed to be more intense. We seemed to be targeted more. You know, it seems like there's like a almost like a bounty, you could say, on Blackwater. Like the insurgents hated us, of course. We're doing a lot of damage. The military's not too keen on us. We're kind of butting heads. You know, a GS-13 guy with a mohawk walking around, not not saluting a general when when he was having to salute him, you know, two years ago when he was yeah. in the military, pisses these generals off, you know. Yeah. And so I'm leading this team, go to Amina City Hall, get into a big firefight there, get some shrapnel. Uh, some minor shrapnel from a grenade. And then, you know, just a couple days later, okay, um, we have my team get blown up, 26 that I was on, just damaged the whole truck. So they put us on a primary status alert, whatever you want to call it. And so I'm sitting there at the chow hall, you know, guys are wounded, guys are tired, guys are exhausted. We're being over, over um, worked. And just exhausted from doing so many runs a day. And all of a sudden, the team's out again, and they get contact. They say they've been blown up. And, uh, and so our initial reaction is to run out there and go help them. This happened to be the event that turned my life upside down. And uh, we start going out there. Uh, and uh, before this, the Blackwater higher-ups, the admin guys are like, Jimmy, you're doing a great job. You know, your men are getting awards, blah, 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 blah. Be more proactive. You know, don't wait on us to tell you what to do. All this, all this stuff. So I, I, I have a very proactive role. I don't have to call it in to the tactical operations center and say, I need permission to do this. It doesn't work because there's no eyes on like in the SEALs. It's not the military. And so I'm out there on my own. Um, 
we go to rescue this team that has supposedly been hit. We hear the, I hear this explosion just rock Iraq. When an EFP, thousands of pounds of explosive go off, I mean, it shakes the buildings in the man camp. So we go straight out with my tactical commander in the lead truck, and uh, we go to lock down this traffic circle. And uh, we hear now, by the time we're locking down that traffic circle in Nisar Square, the infamous Baghdad's Bloody Sunday, uh, that other team is is saying they're okay. They weren't hit, but the EFP EFP went off right beside them, right right outside their compound. So they're on their way back. So since we're out, we decide to lock down the traffic circle. And there's a lot of details, obviously, in here, right? And I've got a gag order where I can't speak about, like, details, right, in, uh, from the DOJ and stuff. But we lock down the traffic circle to facilitate this team to come in, just like any other day. And then all hell breaks loose. A massive firefight breaks loose. And uh, that would change the course and direction of my life for, for many, many years. What can you say about it? Or, or is it... I, I'll, I'll say this, I, and I don't think it was a lot was, and I, I don't know why this was never highlighted, all right? I'll say this, you know, um, you know, we were in many firefights before that that were somewhat bigger than Nisar Square. I will say this, there was contentions in America with Iraq and contractors. The status of arms forces agreement was being signed by Bush and being negotiated at the time. Um, we went in there, massive firefight breaks loose. My vehicle, I should have burned the thing in place because it was, it was, the radiator fluid was up on the window. Um, it was not starting. Something happened to the truck, you know, I, I'll leave the, the, I'll leave the audience to imagine what would happen there. And, um, if I would have burned it in place, uh, with the incendiaries and, and just DD mount out of there. Then you would have saw that truck burning in the traffic circle. You would have saw, oh, these guys were in a major engagement. Something happened here. You know, it's not the movies where you just plot in your rooms and then go out and just wreak havoc. You know, you are getting paid. You you don't want to go to prison. You're you're an American trying to do the right thing. For the most part, everybody was like that. You know, you have your weird apples and stuff, but it's just not like that. It's not the movies. And so we went out there. And uh, firefight broke out. Uh, my truck's disabled. I decide to tow it out in, in this massive engagement, uh, get it back. And by the time I was back at home, uh, back in the barracks room, my, my little man camp room, I had this little bitty TV and I turned it on and it's just all over the news. CNN, Fox, Obama at the time is not president. But he's, I think he's a senator saying, these guys are guilty. We need to put them in prison immediately. You know, no. And that's when I stopped believing anything I saw on the TV after that. Because I realized that, man, you know, you can be portrayed and painted as a freaking monster in this world. And you can be the exact opposite guy. Only God knows the truth at the very end. And I had to learn that over a process. It was very painful to go through that. And and that doesn't take away that, that 17 civilians were killed now insurgents our guys you know leave that up to the fates and god right but um but man it it, it upturned my life what uh, what were the the immediate consequences for you i mean how how did it do that the immediate consequences for me um weren't drastic because we had reports to file i had a team to operate and run I'm over here injured. I'm all wrapped up anyways, you know, from a, from another firefight. It just kind of tells you the environment that we were in. We're getting rocketed all the time. So you, you were shot in another firefight? A grenade shrapnel. Oh, okay. Yeah, get, tossing grenades back and forth with an insurgent, uh, playing grenade tennis, and, uh, um, you know, and uh, a lot of initial accusations and stuff. You know, guys start getting squirrely. You know, the, the day before, they're telling you, Hoss, go out on your own, you know, do your, do, you know, do whatever's necessary. But then after something happens and it's public, you know, guys start to just shell up like little coward turtles. And they're like, they're like, oh, well, you know, we, we told you not to go out, Jimmy. We told you, we told you the exact opposite of what we were really telling you in, in the rooms. Right. And so, man, and so, uh, I was sitting home, you know, 
uh, for for the injury. But I, it wasn't like I was going to operate anymore, anyways. You know, it, I was done anyway. I was done with all that after after experience experiencing some of the coward leadership ab- above me, two admin positions above me. Don't even, I don't feel like their names are worthy of even mentioning, you know, on here. And uh, after that, and after experiencing them, uh, I I was just extremely kind of disheveled. I, you know, because, you know, your whole world turns upside down when you're there for one reason and you get accused for being there for another reason, yeah. right? And so I came home, uh, still wanted to do the SEAL stuff, but now the FBI is, mock, you know, knocking on my mom and dad's uh, door, and um, so you were formally charged or yeah so so um they didn't know what i had done they didn't know what role they they knew i was a team leader but all they knew uh by way of um their their own uh, written statements castigar statements that were sealed and supposed to be protected they all made reports on their protected statements, but all they knew was what the turret gunners had done. Because obviously, if you're the guy, the number one guy through the door all the time, or you're the guy making all the touchdowns, you get the scrutiny. You get the pain train when it comes down to it. You don't get remembered for the touchdowns. You don't get remembered for the teams you saved, the National Guard team you saved. You only get remembered for being a monster, right? Yeah. Uh, if when these things happen. And so they went off of these guys' reports. And and they just went after them full hog. Well, in two thousand and nine, okay, uh, they uh, throw out the case for prosecutorial misconduct. They found that the prosecutors had broken these castigar issues, these sealed documents, and and uh, so they really could not come after those guys. We thought the case was thrown out. At the time, I had to make a big, bold decision to go to the, the SEALs at the time, too. So once it was thrown out, then no charges. You could do whatever you wanted. You got your weapons back. Well, I, I refused to speak to the FBI when they came to my parents' house. I just refused to talk to them. Like, I, you know, my lawyers were like, let, let Jimmy, you don't even have to say anything. This thing is going to go away. There's no way they can charge you with, you know, 17 counts of manslaughter with uh, old 1920s Tommy gun rules, violence with a machine gun. There's, there's no way you're protected in, in Iraq. You were following SOPs. So how, uh, I mean, I guess legally, how did the FBI confiscate your weapons then if you weren't charged? Yeah, so they never confiscated my weapons um, until I was implicated with John McAfee. Okay, that's so later, on. later on. Yeah, right. that's later so you on. Had two run-ins with the FBI. All right, two so, run-ins with the FBI. Yeah, yeah. The so F- far. The, so far, the F, <laughs> the FBI even told me, uh, you, Jimmy, you need to write a book and grow tomatoes from now on yeah, after, sure. my, after my arrest. Yeah. But um, so I had to thread the needle. I, I knew this case was going on with, with Blackwater. They, they, never, they, they hadn't charged me because I was a team leader. They, they just were charging the, the uh, four or five uh, uh, turret. Uh, turret gunners. And so, you know, it, it, was, it was a very, very difficult decision. Um, you know, and uh, I was doing fentanyl patches and, 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 and all the pain meds from the pain management doctor. Now I was getting hooked on that. I was drinking a lot and obviously masking all the pain, masking all the combat stuff, masking the Nisar Square stuff. And they're, they're relating this Nisar Square to the Milai Massacre. Both of them are similar in that they both pretty much ended the war in Iraq. Uh, Milai Massacre uh, was, of course, um, supposedly... I don't even know what to believe anymore, but they lined them up in ditches and shot them. Uh, Nisar Square was a massive firefight, you know, that I explained. And, and so I had to thread the needle, so to speak, and just go for it on a whim. And while I was trying out for the SEALs this time, and I made a, a way better ASVAB score this time, you know, everything came up, you know. Uh, they um, And as I was getting into the SEALs, I kind of threaded the needle. You know, they dismissed the case. Can you, uh, I know there's a gag order. Uh, can you say what happened or is that under, under the gag order? Say what happened about at Nisar square? Like what? Yeah, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even talk about what, what really happened there. You know, I I guess, I mean, why not? If like, if the charges are dropped, how is there still a gag order? Well, because yeah, because I got, I got, I got immunity to speak 
Uh, it's a long story short, but they really, really needed my testimony. And the fact that I wouldn't testify for so long, or the reason why, you know, I wouldn't talk to the FBI for a long time. They kicked out the case, and then when they, when Obama got reelected, they redrum up the case against Blackwater. And, um, and of course, they get pardoned by Trump later on, but they redrummed up the case. And when they redrummed up the case, it's called compulsory immunity, meaning they give me immunity, I come in and tell my story no matter what, right? So when they gave me immunity, so I was never charged with anything, but these other guys were charged with 17 counts of manslaughter and all this, and they were considering doing it with me, and uh, according to my lawyer. And when they, uh, when they, they gave me immunity, I came in and testified. I was, I was in sniper school, mm -hmm. uh, in, NSW sniper, when this happened. And uh, they pulled me out of sniper for a little bit, and I have to go testify. And, um, and man, my testimony, all right, was not compatible with their truth. Uh, my truth wasn't compatible with their truth. Mine being there in the event, uh, them not being there, you know, having sent investigators over there, right, to, to look at the scene. And so when I said that, I pretty much became public enemy number one to them. Yeah. Because they did not like my testimony. Now, my testimony is all out there in public on, on stuff. You know, people can read through it, all that. Um, and uh, being a team leader inside of the closed vehicle, they were trying to rely on my testimony. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you want a super accurate depiction, you got to go off of what the guys on the outside that are actually up there with the up gunners, yeah. able to see. As, as, a, as, a, as a team leader, you've got maps, you've got radios everywhere, you know, trying to coordinate this movement. And so it might have not been very exciting for them, but they relied on my testimony to, uh, to, do, their, to do their diligence and, and what they thought was the truth, right? And so we butted heads, and they, they were pretty determined, according to my lawyer, who was Monica Lewinsky's lawyer for mm -hmm. Clinton, because Blackwater Insurance was paying them $1,000 an hour uh, for years on me. And uh, according to my lawyer, he said, Jimmy, if you don't play ball with these guys, um, play ball. They're just going to make your life. They're going to they're gonna come after your SEAL career, man. Uh, all right, so you thread the needle, charges get dropped. You manage to still join the Navy. Your ASVAB score is up. Uh, <laughs> Which is awesome. Third time's a charm, right? This, this may not be a big deal to people, yeah. but man, when no, you're no. I mean, It's a long struggling. time coming, right? Yeah, um, long time coming. Finally made it like a, a 98 this time. I was pissed yeah. off. So I can only assume, um, I mean, spending four years at Blackwater, and especially the four years that you did doing what you did, now showing up at Bud's, like, I'm assuming a lot of the instructors, or at least some of them knew you, they knew your story. Was there any, not quarter given, but was there... Did any of them like pull you aside and be like, dude, what the fuck happened? Or, you know, they have guys that worked with you or, or whatever. How was your Bud's experience different because of that? So, so I was wondering about that. First, I got United States Marine tattooed all the way across my back, you know, yeah. and I'm just going, dude, I am done, right? Yeah. And then I got the Blackwater thing and I knew a lot of SEALs there. But, you know, um, they didn't give me any quarter whatsoever, like in that aspect, but they, but they really, there was a mutual respect there, you know. Of course, I respected them as instructors and stuff, but I knew a lot of them. And I remember uh, I remember a couple of them coming over and say, Jimmy, man, why are you doing this, bro? Some of you <laughs> called me Haas. Like, Haas, yeah. why are you doing this, man? You, yeah. you, you've, been, you've, been, you've been through all this, man. Like, what are you doing here, bro? And I was like, man, you know I got to do this, man. Come on. And they were like, all right, Raj, that. And uh, I, I will say, though, they, uh, and you know this too, like, you know, you're going to be operating with them in just a couple years. Yeah. And, and. And they want good guys, you know. Yeah. They want they want dudes that are solid. And they looked at me as being as, as a solid OG in that in that game from from Blackwater because they knew me, you know, reputation and stuff. And so it was it was a it was kind of a welcoming party, but there was no quarter given, yeah. you know. Did any of them fuck with you extra because of it? Like, hey, like, <laughs> yeah, fucking yeah. hit the surf extra. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah, for sure. That's fucking great. I remember one guy, Vargas. Uh, Vargas came in my room. I, I, Vargas was this instructor. He's pretty hard as a yeah, Marine. I remember him. Yeah, and he was like, Watson, come here. And I was like, oh, man. And, and like, we're standing there with a boat like this. And he goes, say, he goes, come here. And I'm like, is it a trick, you know, because I'm going to dump this boat on everybody? He's like, come here. And so I leave the guys. And they're like, oh, you know, under the boat. And I came over there. And he's like, 
He's like, man, what's up with you in Blackwater and stuff? I was like, hey, man, I did what I had to do. And he was like, roger that. He's like, you know, don't step on my dick. I won't step on yours. You understand? I said, well, you ain't going to have a trouble doing that with me. And he was like, what the heck? You know, it's uh, always trying to joke, you know? And he's like, he's like, check it out. Come get me. He's like, come. He was basically telling me, you know, I'm, I'm holding you to a freaking high standard here, brother. Yeah. He said, but, you know, but I want to work with you, right? We want to work together. And so he says, come get me. And uh, on the first inspection, and I'm like, dang, man, I wish I wasn't highlighted. I wish I didn't stick out like a sore thumb here, bro. And so, and I was like the USS Watson by now. I was big. And they, they were like, man, there ain't no way you're going to make it with those muscles, man. Because I was a big dude going through and uh, could barely swim and stuff, <laughs> sinking, yeah. you know. And uh, so he, first inspection of the barracks, you know, I remember I'm like, oh, no. And so I, 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 I run out the door. And my buddy Puckett's in the same room with me, uh, Matt Puckett, and he's hard as nails. And um, we clean we clean that room like spotless, man. And uh, I'm walking out the door to go get Vargas, and they're just tearing up everybody's room. And Vargas is like right there in my face. He's like, I'm already here. And I was like, oh, my God, this is terrible, you know. And he comes in, and, um, and the instructor goes, J you know, Watson failed. You know, he's like, he like had some sand in his pocket and like threw it on the ground. And I'm like, you just threw your sand all out of your pocket, you know? And he's like, fell. And, <laughs> and Vargas was like, he looked at me, he goes, no, nah, Watson didn't fail. And I was like, yeah, yes, I did, instructor. He's like, shut up. He's like, <laughs> Matt Puckett's the one that failed. Oh, man. And Matt was like, man, I, that, what? what? <laughs> and so it was funny, man. They yeah, put it off up. on him. It was messed up. That's fucked up. So you're what, 28, 29 going through buds? I was 20, 28, yeah. Right. Um, how was it compared to, I mean, at that point, like you knew lots of seals, you'd wanted to do it for, you know, your whole life. How was it compared to, you know, the build up to it and what you thought it was going to be and, and all that, like finally going through it, what, what was going through your mind and, and how would you characterize the experience? I, I would characterize it as everything that I thought it was going to be, you know, as far as difficulty, I thought it was, um, I thought it was tremendously challenging, but you know, you know, I went into an older age. You went through super young and like a rock star, you know, and that's pretty dang impressive because guys just don't do that. I mean, it's it's rare, you know, to, yeah. because you have you know you got to have a certain dy dynamic about you to do that. But when I went through, I had that like I had maturity. I knew it was going to end, and so you know I didn't have the spring in my step. You yeah. know, felt like I was super old there, which you're not, you know, but um, <clears throat> but I had that experience, and it really helped me out in other aspects, yeah. and. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I had already done the land side. I had already done all the all the deployments, you know, I, I wanted CARE to do. And so uh, when they came by and asked for volunteers for the SDV unit, the Little Black Submarines, I was like, sure, yeah, why not? Which I don't know if it was a smart idea, but <laughs> but went over there. And, uh, and, and they made me a team leader right off the bat because they could see that I had a lot of experience, you know. I wasn't like some kind of apex dude you know but but I, I had a lot of experience and knowledge at the time you know so i think the i think the experiences that i had helped me tremendously going through yeah what uh which stv team did you go to uh, stv one okay so you, STV uh, team one. out to hawaii out to hawaii big uh, hawaii t tell us about uh, stvs kind of generally speaking SEVs, you know, they're the little bitty black subs that people see on on the YouTube and all this. You know, you can't talk about their capabilities, can't talk about what we do. They're national taskings, you know, they're pretty pretty major events. Um, and uh, it's just cold, you know, you do, you. it's just a, a means to get there, you know. We do uh, pretty much everything the other teams do, a full workup like the other teams. Uh, but we we emphasize the our ability to uh, travel wherever we're going from the mothership, you know, the mother submarine to the little baby submarine, yeah. uh, to 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 as a means to get to a location and back. Yeah. So you can't say how fast they go, what their range is, armament that they carry. You can't get into any of that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yep. What uh, I guess what can you share, or or have you shared pretty much everything you can from uh, from that? Yeah, I like to just talk about like you know. A story that Matt Leathers uh, said to us, you know, Matt Leathers passed away. Yeah. Good friend of mine, good friend of a lot of SEALs, hard as nails, loved that guy. Uh, when I got there, he had already done six years in SDV. Yeah. And uh, 
man, you know, you think you've been around and then you get around a guy like that that has done six years at SDV. And I'm like, man, I haven't done anything, right? And so when we got there, you know, just as a brand new guy, um, he came up and he said, hey, y'all want to know what it's like to be in the back of an SDV? And uh, we're like, yeah. He's like, well, the only thing that matters is, is time. And uh, he says, you want to know how to tell Tom? And we're like, yeah, tell us. You know, all we want to know as new guys is what it's like to be back in the SDV. It's an all-volunteer unit. They used to make guys go to SDV, but they found that guys were quitting. You know, guys, di guys did not do well unless you volunteer for that. Because if yeah. you're forced to go do that, it's too it's too constricting. You know, it's claustrophobic. You know, it's it's quite terrible in, in a lot of aspects, you know, because you're pushing your body to the maximum limitations because it's an underwater submersible. It, it fills with water. It's not dry in there like a lot of people think, which is hard to do, right? And so he asked us, the only thing that matters, he said, do y'all want to know how to tell time in these SCVs? And we're like, yeah. He says, well, the only way to tell time, because you can't lift up your arm, you can't check your watch, you're cramped in there, you, you know, the guys back there are big. It's not like they have little dudes go back there, you know? We had big guys back there, and um, then they shut the hatch over you, and you're, all you can do is hold your face mask or regulator and hope to God it doesn't get kicked out. And so he's the only way to tell time is, is by this. He says, you know, uh, you can't check your watch. He said, by the, he, uh, he was, uh, what did he say? He said, um, he said, right when you think that you're about to freak out on the dive, on the mission, right when you think that you're about to just panic, strip your regulator, your mask off, and bolt to the surface, kill everybody in, do, in the process. He says, right when you think you cannot take one more second, he said, that's when you're about halfway done. <laughs> and we were like, Dude, we were like, oh, it's over, bro. Yeah. I was like, what have I done? Yeah. You know? What's the longest uh, amount of time you're underwater? Yeah, it, 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 it really depends. You can be under there a long time, like hours and yeah. hours, because there's a lot of aspects involved. But you, yeah. could, you could be transferring stuff. You could be transferring, uh, you know. Is there a, a longest stresses? amount of time that you've been underwater? Uh, at SDV that you can say hours wise, I don't think I, I don't think I can say that. Yeah. But but uh, but I've been under there a long time. Okay. Other guys have been there a lot longer than me. Yeah, you know. Can you say how many guys fit in it? Uh, uh I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I could. Tough, tough I get nut slammed to crack for it. On right. I get slammed for it. Yeah. But yeah, I don't I mean, want to push the envelope. Um, I guess if you could speak to um, being in Hawaii and like we. Uh, did some cross training with SDV and uh, not with them in terms of the capability, but just with the guys, like we were doing CQB runs with them and, and I yep. uh, spent about a month in Hawaii on my first deployment. And uh, one of the things that I was really thankful for to be a part of was getting to dive just on Dragers. I mean, not again, not with SDVs, but just a normal dive profile in uh, and around Pearl Harbor. And it was, it was, pretty fucking eerie honestly it was a night dive closed circuit so you know super super quiet like not far from where the arizona was and it was just surreal you know it was like it was a high bioluminescence night and uh, i just remember thinking like dude the amount of fucking history and and carnage that's in this body of water that's right underneath us and the shit that's happened here in the last 50 you know 100 years is hard to even fucking comprehend and uh, it was a really powerful moment did you experience any of that getting to work right right there because i remember like one yeah. of the fucking radio towers still had bullet holes in it yeah you talk about ominous brother this is crazy so we died that that in pearl city we died that whole harbor right and you know in diving at night you always have to have certain reference points you know because you can't come up you can't but you can't even see your hand in front of your face so you got your board you got you know you got a li limited limb you know chem light to look around and stuff you have you can't see you can't reference so one of our reference points was across the harbor when you hit uh, one of the sunken ships of pearl harbor wow. and that ship had a medal of honor recipient still inside it yeah they had like 50 or 80 guys still locked in the the ship, unable to retrieve it, locked it down. So it's like a permanent memorial to those guys. So as you like, as you as you touch this ship in in the you know 2 a.m. 
in this murky harbor in Pearl Harbor, you know, you were touching that memorial. Yeah. Wow. And then you were you were banking off that and going down the entire side of that ship. And as you were going down, it was it was ominous because you're like, dang man, there's there's guys from Pearl Harbor that are trapped in here mm. and now I'm diving these waters. And that was one of our reference points to go out. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah, super yeah. intense. Yeah. Um how many years did you spend at SDV? Six years. Six years. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what else can you share about being there? It was a great time, great brotherhood. Uh, you know, um, and one of the uh, we were doing VBSS from from the bottom up, and uh, I got injured there, and um, uh, had a had a what's equivalent to like a traumatic brain injury with an arterial gas embolism. The, uh -huh. they, they say that, you know, guys are going to get injured there. You're going to get diving injuries there. Like you're, 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 pro, you're most likely going to get chambered at SDV. It's just a fact, right? The problem is, is if you don't get chambered soon enough. And I had delayed treatment, 4th of July weekend. Long story short, I, I end up going to the tripler. They give me morphine. They don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, and then I end up going to the chamber way too late. And so that caused a tremendous amount of damage in a very short period of time. The lack of oxygen to your brain, a C, you know, a bubble in your C5 or whatever. And so I end up going to tripler. Then I end up going to the, the dive chamber, probably uh, table nine extensions for 14 days straight with one day break. Holy hell. And so that's like nine hours a day. In the chamber with pure O2, and then taking you off, and you yeah. know O2 toxicity is a problem. Seizures is a problem. It was a very, it was a challenging time in my life, man. Oh. From going from a team leader to sniper to to the bottom, man, yeah. to not being able to move your body, to being really hurt and yeah. and kind of ghost like symptoms and scary, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, did you do combat deployments from SDV? Did a national taskings, man. Yeah. And that, that's it, I can say. Yeah. Yeah, I can't talk about yeah. where or what or any of that stuff. Yeah. Stayed busy. Stay, stayed real busy, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's like a, a two year workup yeah. for one one mission. Yeah. So, you know, and it's and it's pretty pretty hardcore, man. Yeah. Long, 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 long nights. Yeah. A lot of diving. Yeah. Uh, mentally, how were you doing after the Blackwater stuff? And, and, and at what point in that six year period, uh, did your brother pass away and, and kind of walk us through, uh, the, the other side of being there? Yeah. So, so, um, mentally I was, I felt like I was doing great, kind of like at the apex of your, your seal career. Right. And, and then, and then in 2013, things kind of started to fall apart. You know, my little brother died, uh, I started drinking constantly, total neglect to my ex-wife, you know, ex, you know, you hear that a lot in the veterans, you know, yeah. and the reason why you hear ex a lot is because, you know, the deployments wear you out, you know, you're, you know, it's not like the Roman Empire where you're walking back uh, for two years and around campfires anymore, you're, you're literally coming home in 72 hours, you know, several days to get home and now you just walk in and honey boo boo standing there and your little dog and, and you're forced to assimilate back into society it just doesn't doesn't you're you're we're just humans your yeah. brains don't compute that you know so after my little brother incident i knew that my life was heading downhill the accident just exasperated uh issues went to james haley veterans hospital for a while and then you know started getting my feet back on the ground you know was a team leader like i said and and was called in the office one day and uh, by my commander and we were on the we were on first name basis. My wife's field readiness group, you know, FRG, you know, president for the enlisted. You know, we're having these barbecues and stuff. Things are going hunky dory. The sun's out, right? But the storm's about to come in my life. And uh, I get called in the office by the commander, and he's like, Jimmy, he's like, you got ten days left to be in the Navy. And I'm like, I said, what would you say? And I thought it was a joke. And he said, you got ten days left to go uh, to stay in the Navy. And I said, I'm not going nowhere, man. He says, if you try to fight this, you're, you're going to get steamrolled. He said, this is coming from all the way top. Like he was pointing past Admiral. This is still the Blackwater stuff. This, yeah, yeah. so I'm in the SEALs, and I testified for Blackwater. They didn't like how I testified, so the FBI, kind of a rogue agent, I don't want to say the FBI in total here. I met some great guys there, you know, uh, 
And uh, but this rogue agent sends a memo to my command, uh, full of lies. Uh, you know, mischaracterizing. They call it you know mischaracterizing my testimony. If I lied, I would have been charged with perjury. That's how much they didn't like me. And so they send this letter to my my seal command, and uh, of course the commander, you know, trying to be a good little boy, uh, you know, commander, seal commander, it says, you know what, uh, the FBI sent it, it must be true, and not without even checking my testimony. To see, just lying, it's easy. Just or bringing you in and asking you about it, bringing me in, asking about it, allowing me to say, hey, man, no, look, this is what I said in my testimony. Even if I said that, it's it. Why does it matter? It was in Blackwater. I was following SOPs, ROEs. We were, anyways. So he he calls me and says, you know, if you fight this, it's like charging a machine gun nest. And he was playing off my time in the Marines. He knew I was a Marine too. And I said, sir, if it wasn't for dudes charging machine gun nests, we wouldn't be standing here, you know. And so that was my ethos. That was my ethos from that point on. When you mentioned the accident, are you saying the diving accident, or? Um, or the yeah. dick accident, the dick accident, the diving accident, my little brother dying, all of it was just accumulation. of And problems. that was all during that six year period. That was all during that six year period. And then my best friend died. Matt died. Yeah. Brett, Brett Allen Merrihue died. He was like my best friend, man. It was tough. How did you break your dick or what happened? I got caught in a, I had a, an RPG blew it off. All right. No, I'm just kidding, man. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was back blast area. No, it was, uh, it was, um, a belt sandy accident. When Matt Leathers uh, passed away, or when they couldn't find him out in the ocean, uh, what I started doing was I started making these memorial boards. Because, you know, when they don't have a coffin to pin the trident in, uh, I started making these uh, boards and painting. You know, I paint a little bit, and I would paint this, I painted this portrait. But as I'm sanding this thing down, I'm in those little bitty shorts. It's in Hawaii, you know. Yeah. There's a family over here loading their groceries up, little kids. I got the extension cord on this belt sander going back and forth like this. Somehow it grabs my, my shorts, my little silky shorts, and pulls the entire thing into the, the belt sander. Yeah. Like Laffy Taffy, like a mouse through a door crack, straight up, just, I didn't know it, it could flatten like that. <laughs> and I didn't know it could stretch that long, bro. <laughs> and and it, so it goes up, through, and, and kind of out. Oh, man. And, and it, immediately when it happened, I released the trigger, you know, just, uh, and if I would have, if I would have kept the trigger down just this much more, it would have right so just ripped it off. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that saved me is it was the super, uh, gritty paper, like eight or something like rocks, you know? And I think that helped me because if it would have slid, it would have been worse, but it grabbed and, and, and got up in there. The only thing I could do was stand there. And it's inside now. It's burning hot. It was burning because it was been going for a while. And the only thing I can do is I look over, and I don't want these little kids to have PTSD anymore. You know, I don't want to have these kids or this family have PTSD. So I decide I'm going to crawl under the garage, you know, and shut the door on me. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die like a man in, in the garage. like With my dick in a sander. With, with my dick in a sander, <laughs> and I'm not going to allow nobody to see it. I'm not going to go out like that. And so all I could think of is like that Oprah Winfrey show where the guy gets a uh, a tree, it falls down yeah. on his legs, and he cuts his leg off with his knife, and everybody thinks, how could he do that? Well, how can a fox chew off their leg if they get yeah. it caught in a, a trap? Well, that's my reaction was I just want to get this thing off me, no matter what. And so I pulled it as hard as I could. I just I pulled it, and it just kind of stretched it out and stretched it, and it was just – unbelievable how it wouldn't come off it was just clamped in and it hurt it was starting to hurt it didn't hurt at first it just burning and my, i guess adrenaline i just but i knew it was bad and so I, I just calmed myself you know and i started processing the situation i said okay how do i get this off me and so i went and unplugged the cord and then I looked at the situation, you know, take the the power source out, looked at the situation, and I said, okay, I'm going to go get a screwdriver and start unscrewing this thing systematically and, and undo it and get it out. Well, all of a sudden, it's like dawned on me, just release the the clip that loosens it to get the, 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 uh, the sandpaper out. And uh, so I, I did that, and it loosened it enough to where I could start pulling 
just pulling it out little by little. Inch by inch by inch by inch by inch. <laughs> yeah, you know. How many? <laughs> <laughs> it was, man, 18, 19, 30, 40, 50. So that does stretch long. Yeah, I thought it was the extension cord, but it was actually that. You know, it was crazy. Uh, and uh, it was crazy. So, no, I get it out, and uh, and I it, it doesn't look recognizable. It just looks like a black burnt pancake or something weird, according to my a wife at the time. And uh, I go inside, and she's like, I, I say, hey, Stop what you're doing. Stop making cupcakes for FRG. Um, I said, I just got my penis caught in a belt sander. I said, I need to go to the emergency room. She said, oh, my God, I'll go get ice. And I said, I said, hold the patrol. I said, don't do anything. This is way beyond any ice prom. I said, get your butt in the car and take me to the emergency room. I got to stay calm right now. And so we go to the emergency room. The doctor comes up to the window like a drive through that's how, how, how bad this is. I don't go in the emergency room. I don't go in there and wait. I said, no, tell him to come out here right now. Tell him what happened. I got my penis caught in a bell center. And so he comes out there like McDonald's, le- le- leans in the window, and he says, hey, so was it, was it an 8 by 17 or a 13 by 7 whatever? Like, like who cares? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, dog, no, no offense, man, but does it matter? Yeah. He says, well, it's always interesting because it's happened before. I said, what the heck? I said, why don't they put a warning label on this thing? They got a white piece of paper on the cord that's, that has a hand with an X. Yeah. It's like they need to put the thing on there and put an X through it. <laughs> but I guess everybody's too embarrassed to say anything like yeah. they, that actually happened to them. Anyways, I had to go through some serious surgery on that. What, uh, I mean, I guess what, what happened to it? Like it just it got flattened to the point where it was not didn't look yeah, like so, so you have two pontoons that run up and down your penis, and you then you have the uh, urethra, right? And uh, um, fortunately, mine was just the pontoons were flattened and not damaged, which is a big deal. The the urethra was just crushed, just smashed and crushed, and so they literally had to go in there like a fish. They had to flay it open, uh, cut around the the head, and then. Um, rotor rooted out is what they explained. That's what they called it, rotoring out the urethra and uh, replaced that. Um, they wanted to do skin grafts from the inside of my cheek. I said, now do whatever you can do, but please don't start taking skin off my cheek and put it on there because, you know, it's a situation, conflict of interest. And um, You're blowing yourself off. Yeah, it's weird. And, and so I was like, I don't know about this anymore. And so they – they sewed it up, uh, a lot of stitches, wrapped up like a mummy. It looked like it was on upside down for a long time, and I just I was really pissed off. And I told the doctor, I said, "Man, if this don't come back right, man, we're gonna have problems. We're gonna meet behind the berm, you know." Yeah. And uh, he's like, "No, don't worry, it's gonna be fine, you know." And uh, he was real nonchalant, young guy. I was like, "Man, I hope this guy knows what he's doing." It was, it was basically a sex change guy, a urethoplasty surgeon dude that does sex changes. I was, I was like, man, let's be careful what you do, you know? So I recovered out of it, and it was it was fine. It so came it, back fine. Like totally back to normal? Totally back fine. Like you can't tell at all? No, well, you, you know, it was it was sideways to the left for a while before, and uh, um, very small, <laughs> and, uh, and then after, it grew an inch, and then it was all the way to the right. And I said, what's going on here? And then, and I was really happy, you know, about it. <laughs> Super happy about that. I said, at least I got this. And then about four or five months later, dang thing went back to same, the same. No, yeah. then it was, now, now it's straight, yeah. but went back down to red, original size. Yeah. I'm not, I just don't understand how life is, man. Yeah. That's a fucking trip. Two man. steps forward, one yeah. step back, man. Uh, how did you piss what, like during recovery? Did they have to do a yeah. catheter? Catheter, bad, and uh, the pain, the pain was just extreme, brother. How uh, for how long? Oh, the pain was just like brutal. months. No, Please. the pain was extreme for two, three weeks, but hardcore. Like, like I would take a bullet in the head before ever going through that again. Wow. Like, I, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't want to live again because it's just too much. I mean, technically, I guess I would go for it, you know, yeah. do it again. But, but physically, the most painful thing you've experienced? Physically, the, the most painful thing, because it felt like sandpaper was inside your urethra all the time going back. And then the catheter would get real dry. 
and then all you and then all you could do is pour lidocaine uh, all around it, and then that dries it out, and the stitches are just stretching out because <laughs> you get this weird stimulation, and, and, and oh, things happen, and you're like thinking of car crashes and school buses, yeah. like, car, like terrible things to just. Uh, uh, for it to not happen to not happen but it, but it's called some weird prism something and it's torturous yeah. i told my ex to get out of the bed i said get out of the bed don't yeah. touch me because uh, i i'm hurting yeah that makes my asshole pucker hearing you talk about it man <sighs> that's fucking brutal bro i can't even believe i went through that man Jeez, that's and, nuts i mean i'm just glad everything went back to normal like work's fine everything's Totally normal. Yeah, I almost got. Yeah, yeah, I almost got in a fight with another seal because he's like, "Oh yeah, bro, I got my uh, in Denny's." And he said, "Yeah, I got my thigh caught in a belt sander." I almost got in a fight with him. I said, <laughs> well, "What you know about getting your yeah. penis caught in a belt sander? You don't yeah. know nothing, man." Yeah, yeah, that's brutal. Um, all right, so the six year period, you have the the dick accident, you lose your brother. Commander says you got ten days left. The Blackwater stuff flares flares back up. Did you end up getting out ten days later? No, man, so, no. I, I, Mike, I went through hell to get there. You know, all my life, accumulative experiences, uh, going through the Nisar thing, um, the, the Marine Corps, all that in, in a lifelong dream. And then uh, really um, the whole process to become a SEAL, you know, sometimes I think we forget how difficult things are. And, and you know, it, 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 we, we lose the appreciation of that, you know. For me, I, I really, you, you appreciate things that you work blood, sweat, and tears for. And so for me to come in there after everything I'd been through and be told that I have 10 days left to, to remain in the Navy. You know, I told the commander, I said, listen, I said, my God will save me. Now, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was living for God. It wasn't like I was this choir boy, nothing like that. In fact, the exact opposite. But I still voiced out, my God will save me. And I still voiced out like, hey, man, then let's charge the machine gun nest. Maybe I might die fighting this. And everybody told me I was crazy. Because once the Admiral Losey at the time, once he makes a call to, to discharge you without any evidence, without any proof, it was total unlawful command influence. The guy gets kicked out for it later on down the line. It's a long story, literally. Uh, unlawful command influence. And uh, once they make that command, it's over. Like, there's no... Re, you know, there's no recourse of action, but I just said, you know, I put my feet down. I said, you know, honorable is not on a piece of paper. They offered me an honorable discharge with all the bells and whistles to get out. I said, if I, if I did something so dishonorable and I have 10 days left to get out of the Navy, why are you trying to give me all the bells and whistles? I said, no. And, and I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like, you know, you know, well, like, no, it was, it was hard. It was, it was crying at night. It was, it was, you know, you know, you know, internalizing everything. Like, what do I do? Like, it, it was getting counsel from my dad. Thank God he was there to give me counsel as a judge, as a Texas judge. And, and, uh, and he was like, they can't do that. It's, un, it's unlawful command influence. It's ridiculous, you know. There's something wrong here, Jimmy. And whenever you think something's wrong with something, it is wrong. And I knew something was wrong. I didn't know how I was going to prove it. I had to unseal my grand jury testimony. Ten days later, you know, my commander, he really turned you know, his name was like Commander Evenson, and, and he really, really turned. And, and nobody really realized why he turned at the time, like, like, like into this guy that was willing to just, just destroy his own guys. And, and we later found out he got captain right when he was getting out, uh, retiring out of the Navy. Like, it just doesn't happen a lot, right? And by Admiral Losey gave him captain. And I think it was a quid pro, pro quo favor for this and a lot of guys do that's my own truth right it's my own opinion but uh, he says you know you got 10 days left in the navy jimmy and um after after that 10 days i walked by him i threw every complaint at him i could truthfully you know another seal really good seal brought me in said jimmy you're one of the best guys of the command that may not be true but he was really support the seals had my back and they were like jimmy you're a good dude man we can't believe this but you don't understand we were in the room with Evenson, these JAG guys, Losey, and they straight up said that you're getting kicked out of the Navy. They don't care if you're the best SEAL at SDV command. It doesn't matter. You're getting kicked out because it's direct orders from above, meaning above Admiral Losey. Remember how Blackwater, this, this was a very political event, and they wanted to destroy my testimony next time I came in to the DOJ. They were mad at me. 
And so I end up fighting it um, for um, dang near two years. Wow. End up having to go to a mental hospital because of it, brother. Did you, I mean, were you on active duty in a normal capacity for that two years, or did they put you in yeah. like an admin hold? It wasn't even really an admin hold until the admin board. Uh, I, I just kind of remained there, stop, stopped really doing anything with the team, but just, you know, you know that, that yeah. limbo, right? And uh, it was my, the hardest times in the SEALs for me was not the missions, not buds, not this, this advanced training, not SDV, not, not the long dives at night, 26 weeks of dives. Right? It was that fight. It was the fight of my life, man. And, man, the reason why I did it is because I couldn't imagine my sister or somebody going in there that I knew that they would be able to pull this on. I just kept imagining, like, what if it was somebody weaker, like, that came in? They, they probably do this to military people all the time, and they just, okay, 10 days left, I got to go. I said, no, nah, man. I said, you guys picked a bad luck lottery with me. It's, it's on like Donkey Kong, and I threw every single, legally, that I could with lawyers uh, representing myself when I ran out of money, going to the mental hospital, hung myself in a mental hospital. Oh, shit. Yeah. When they, when they, they said I was faking it, I was like, no, there, ain't no, there, there ain't nothing fake about me, brother. What was the, the cause or the reason for going? Uh, just like a mental breakdown or what? Just total mental breakdown. After fighting them, after going through all these things, um, and, um, you know, uh, went to a, a Balboa Naval Medical. Well, there was other, some, some other team guys going through there. Man, I didn't know. You know, at the time, you always think it's just you going through all this pain and hell. But there's other guys going through hell. And there was some other SEALs in there going through bad stuff. And, and I remember them calling me in there and them saying, you know, Admiral Losey wants to send you a message. And I said, all right. The Jack, two JAG lawyers came in there because I was in there a year almost in the middle hospital. I was in the middle hospital for almost a year. In, 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 yeah, in there for a long time. And, I, and they two, finally two JAG lawyers came in there and said, Jimmy, you know, you fought a long time. You fought a good fight, bro. But we just came here to tell you that Admiral Losey wants to send you a message. And I said, send it. And they and I, I had finger pain on me. I'm doing finger pain in the middle hospital, brother. I mean, just with my basically underwear on. I didn't get big beard. I didn't care about nothing, bro, at the time. And it was hell because I had a wife. I had the SEAL career. Now I'm just like in the mental hospital. And, um, and they said, you know, Admiral Losey wants to tell you a message. And I said, send it. And he, they said, um, Admiral Losey said, you can stay in here as long as you want. But as soon as you get out, it's going to be the same result. You're going to be kicked out of the Navy. And I said, um, they said, don't you want to respond to that? Don't you want to say anything? I said, I got finger painting in five minutes. Is that it? And they, were, they looked at me like, shit, this guy, this guy is, uh, he's, not, he's not cut out of the same cloth as some others. And so, um, and so I was at the end of my rope, literally. And, were, um, you, were you medicated? Like, did they have you on a bunch of shit? Not really. You know, they, they, they would try out different things, but I was just in pain, man. I just had a lot of things going on. And, and so they called, the doctors called me in and say, you know, we're discharging you. And, and I mean, I was dead serious. I was, I was all in. And I told my wife that. I said, man, I said, Leah, I'm, I don't think you understand. I'm, I'm in the fight for my life, and I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll even kill myself if I have to because of this. That's how extreme I was because I, I felt like it was so wrong, and plus all the combat deployments and stuff had messed me up, man, messed me up bad. And so they said, we're about to release you. I said, well, you're going you're gonna to regret that. And they said, what does that mean? I said, well, it's just you're going to regret that, you know. And, um, and uh, I had issues, Mike. I had a bit bad issues, and I was in the darkest place of my life. And so as soon as they said that, I walked out, and, um, and um, I took a sheet, and I tied knots in it. And I went in the bathroom, and I had already planned this out. I, I, had, I had looked at it for a while because it's very difficult to do at a hospital like that. And there was a, a hole in the wall, and uh, I tied the sheet in a bunch of knots, a bunch of knots. And I just stuffed, I loaded it like a clip of bullets. I stuffed the knots in there. You mean a magazine? 
Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just fucking. My bad, man. I mean, comments. <laughs> this guy's had yeah. bullets, yeah. you know. A clip, a clip. Yeah, a clip. No, no, that's yeah. a, a clip is in the Marines, man. I, I got to make, make light of the heaviness, at least for, for a quick glimpse. No, please do. Yeah. And so I go in the bathroom. I load this hole up with the sheet. I, I put the sheet around my neck, tied as tight as I can. And uh, I launch myself off head first. I stand up on the toilet and I launch myself off head first. Uh, and I, uh, I remember, I remember standing on the toilet with this sheet on my neck and, and, and I'm like, I'm like, damn, man. I was like, this, this is how it ends. You know, this, this is, this is how it ends. You don't, you don't, you don't ever imagine being there, but it, but for me, it was, it was fighting corruption, making a statement. Like, I, I guess, I guess I'll die and just show you how serious I am show you how serious this is. to me it was life and death and so um i launched myself off head first with the intent to kill myself and uh woke up on the ground and this this uh girl was freaking out one of the staff members she her knee was on my neck that hurt more than the hanging and, and they were on top of me crying some staff members were screaming holding my head my neck hurt real bad i just kind of came conscious and they're trying to get this thing off, and it really wrenched down. And um, and then they did X-rays, and 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 the the head doctor in the mental hospital was like, "I didn't think you would do anything." I said, "I told you, I told you, man. Don't." I said, I, "I'm not somebody to mess with. I'm not. I'm just not that guy." And so um, they put me through the MRIs, put me through the CT scans. I had fractured my neck. It was bad. And at that point, the doctor said, "Jimmy, stay in here." As long as he, uh, as long as it's going to take for him to get the help he needs, and that's when Adam Losey, man, he backtracked, got terrified, said uh, he called the the Jag came back in, said, hey Jimmy, uh, we see that you're real for real, and uh, we're here for you, buddy, and uh, you know you can stay in the Navy now and all this stuff, and wow. and I chose to honorably retire out. I retired medically for for it. I was done, man, after that. You don't go through that and then stay yeah. in. I was done. Well, man, that's a heavy, heavy story, man. Uh, man, I can see a lo- some emotion brimming to the surface while you're while you're telling it. Very uh, understandably. Um, do you remember what was going through your mind as you decided to to actually do it? Because I know, um, you know, especially in our community suicide is a, is a problem. I mean, it will just say in the veteran community, uh, period, it's a huge problem. And a lot of guys think about it. A lot of guys struggle with it. Um, the percentage of guys that, that actually go through with deciding, yeah, I am going to do it versus thinking about it is there's a significant difference. Do you remember crossing that, that line of, of where you said, yeah, I am going to do it and, and what that was like inside your mind? Yeah, the, I, I believe there's a line in every man's, there's a, there's a flip, and it can be switched on for good, and it can be switched on for total violence and total aggression and, and total survival. And in my act to kill myself, I was making a statement of survival. And maybe that's philosophical, maybe that's crazy, but, but when, I, when they told me that I was pretending, when they told me that I wasn't serious, Having knowing myself and knowing how serious I am, I like to joke around, but Napoleon said it best you must laugh at man to avoid crying for him. And so I was dead serious, Mike. I, when they told me that, that I was pretending that that switch flipped off, and I just stared at him and I said, I said, All right, I said, Is that your final answer? Is that it? And they said, That's right. Yeah. I said, That's it. And I said, Okay. And that to me was like, test me and see what happens. Yeah. You know, f around and find out. They f around, and uh, so I had to go through with it. And so that was a long walk from that office directly to that back room, that toilet to hang myself. Yeah, it, that that walk was a took years in my life walking that hallway because I as, as I walked, I was processing. Damn, I'm I'm gonna do it, man. And there ain't no return. There's no return. And that same feeling I've gotten in the past before about going into firefights, about going into a fight, whatever it is, is like when that switch goes off, it's it's 
all or nothing. Yeah. You know, black or white. Yeah. There's no backing out. Yeah. Yeah, that's heavy. Um, Surviving it, did it change your perspective on life, generally speaking? Yeah, you know, I, I when I woke up from it, I thought, dang, man, I did that. that that's just crazy. And I, I don't want to live like that no more, Mike. And um, I can remember... I can remember crying out to God and saying, man, I, I don't, I don't want to live like this no more. I don't even care about the seals no more. I don't care about any of this. I like, who cares, man? I just want to be right. Like I, okay, I guess, you know, I lost it somewhere on those combat deployments. You know, I did my best. I put my best foot forward. Didn't work out. My, my, my wife left me later, you know, she stayed with me through, through that trial, you know, good honor. And, uh, and, um, and I, I needed I needed a miracle in my life to 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 move on, and uh, survival mode kicked in. Uh, I I think it was a release. It was it was a relief to process out of the Navy, uh, and uh, to get redemption there with some of the guys that did the unlawful command influence got out. But man, that transition to get out was a very 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 hard yeah. for me. Can you uh, walk us through that? Yeah, so I get out and I start working for Saved in America. It's former team guys um, saving kids in San Diego County, human trafficking, uh, saving uh, human trafficking victims. It's an $800, $800 million industry a year in San Diego County, a revolving doors for cartels. They use a girl up to 40 times a day. It could be a rich girl, poor, poor girl, doesn't matter. It could be the neighbor. Uh, the cartels have a system where a kid runs away at 14. Uh, the druggie that wants some crack knows that if he goes to the cartel, he'll they'll get a crack rock for reporting some girl walking around. They pick her up, transfer across state lines. That's how it works. Now, what we were doing was not as great as it sounds, adventurous as it sounds, because we were just cordoning off the area, working with lo- local, local law enforcement, and then coming in and, and half rescuing the girls. But I was really disappointed in the work. Because it wasn't like they were running out hugging us before it. You know, they were mad at us because they called the drug lease. The cartels put them on. Did that for a little bit. And then my boy, Taylor Calf, big T Calf, you know, <laughs> man, French Foreign Legion what guy. Legend here on the show for sure. Legend on the show, the Ritland show. What a great episode that was. And, and um, you know, me and him were boys. I mean, me and him were boys. I was on the run um, uh, from basically myself, God, the law, and – and Taylor was on the run from himself, and and we both met up. I went to Mexico and Colombia to do some mercenary stuff. He went to the French Foreign Legion. He went. We both met in Hawaii, yeah. and we both made a decision. He went to the French Foreign Legion. I went to uh, Colombia, Medellin, Medellin, Colombia. Started doing work out there. But right when I got out, did Saved in America, I was still lost. I, I I planned on being in the teams for a long time. I didn't know what I was going to do. That was my life. That's the mistake I made. I was living that life and I wasn't planning on a future. That's yeah. all I had planned for. And so all of a sudden one day <laughs> Taylor calls me out of blue. He's like, yo, bro, what's up? <laughs> and I'm like, yo, T Cab, what's up, man? And he's like, yo, bro, you know John McAfee? And I was like, nah. He's like, check your computer, dog. And I was like, <laughs> that sounds oh, just fucking like yeah, him. what's up, bro? <laughs> check your computer, dog. And and I said, uh, what's up, man? He's like, this guy's gonna call you. I don't know how Taylor had this connection through through another team guy or something weird, but uh, there were you know I said I said how do you know this guy? He's like uh, so some guy said that John McAfee wants the best seal out there to go guard him. Well, you know I was by no means that, but I had just got out. It was all timing. Yeah. So so I had just got out. Cav was like, "Yo, bro, here he is," you know. And so he gets me. Uh, so John McAfee calls me. He's like, "You know who this is, boy?" And I'm like, "Why are you calling me a boy?" You know. But yeah, yeah. I was like, "I think it's John McAfee." He said. He said, that's right. He said, how much do you charge? Because he was down. He was brass tax, this guy. And um, I said, 500 to 1,000 a day. I just made that up, you know. 500 to 1,000 a day, depending on, depending on the threat. And he's like, he's like, that's ridiculous. I only pay my Green Berets 250 a day. And he, like, spit out his scotch. You could tell, man, he was pissed. And I don't know why, why I get this got into me, Mike, because I would have took this for a lot less. And uh, – I said, well, I said, it's your life, sir. And when I said that, he said, damn. <laughs> he said, you drive a hard bargain. He says, you got to fly to my house right now. I said, right now? 
from California. I was in Valley Center, California. He said, right now. I said, all right. So I flew to Lexington, Tennessee, started guarding John McAfee. Before you did that, the the window that you, I don't know if it's convenient or not, that you glossed over about mercenary work in fucking Columbia. What, yeah. What was that all about? Yeah, that, that's actually after John McAfee. Okay, so we'll, we'll hit McAfee first then. So, yeah. so you fly straight there, go right into guarding him. What was that like? Fucking crazy house, crazy lifestyle. What, Bro, what, were, what did it, you get into? It was crazy. It was like walking into a Goodfellas casino, you know, with, with the mob and everything in the background. It was, it was crazy, man. A lot of things, I don't even know what I can say, but, but I got there and his guards are like, they're carrying weapons. They're drinking alcohol, you know, in the seals. Oh, the yeah, yeah, they're drinking alcohol. Like, like, well, check this out. I'm like, oh my god, man, this is terrible, right? Fucking and cowboys. so, yeah, yeah, straight up cowboys, and and then they're doing crypto trading on these computer screens, like all these like little candlesticks and stuff that I don't know anything about at the time. At the time, and so I'm like, what's going on here? I don't crypto. What is that? This is when Bitcoin was real low, right at the beginning of crypto. This happened, man. Right when it was getting, but but only like super it wasn't your old grannies on there trading it was like super experienced traders and stuff that knew the game okay and so john mcfee um he comes out with a bunch of weapons on literally he had like a mac 10 in a 1911 like like on his bike like it's and you know as a seal it's kind of ridiculous to see that you're like yeah. what the heck is this like, guy who's doing? this fucking like come Yahoo. on man yeah exactly and uh so but he comes out he's smoking a cigarette backwards he like comes out and he's like he's like um He's like, let's step outside and talk. And I was like, okay. He's got these big attack dogs. I don't know nothing about McAfee. He just came back from Belize, you know, being from from murder for 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 him being suspected of murder. He ran for the police government. Crazy story. I chose not to really dig, look, into, it. dig into it just because I wanted to know him who he was. And that's not the guy that I knew though. Like the guy that I experienced was kind of like a loving father to me. Took me in under his wing. We went outside that first. Uh, day and i'll never forget it he seemed kind of clumsy but kind of scary things about him right super philosophical guy he's very smart he brought me outside and he looked me dead in the eyes and with these crystal clear blue eyes and he has a very distinct voice kind of like calf too but he's like um who's the most feared man on the battlefield jimmy and i looked at him and i said i don't know and when he looked at you you just stared into his eyes like locked eyes and I said, I don't know. And he said, it's the oldest man on the battlefield. He said, do you understand that? And I, and I just looked at him, and the way he said it to me, it kind of hypnotized me because I was like, you know, I ain't going to ever mess with this guy. I, you know, and from now on, if he says aliens kidnapped him, I may not believe it, but damned if I do. You know, they, if, if he gets caught by aliens, they do something weird to him at night, I'm not going to get blamed for it. So from that point on, I just took everything he said, as as truth face value face value i said okay prove me wrong and as we went along he put me through a lot of tests and um i started asking him i said you know one day i said hey sir if i gave you 200 bucks would you put this in crypto for me he said what the hell are you talking about son he said you better learn this yourself i said well i don't know about it will you teach me he started teaching me every excellent teacher started teaching me everything he could, and he knew that he could, uh, about cryptocurrency, about business, about investing, about negotiations. Uh, and his negotiations weren't that hard. And I ran all of his negotiations for him uh, because his negotiations were non-negotiable. So that made it very easy to negotiate his, his terms. It was just my way or the highway or where we're, we're walking. These are the terms? Yeah. There's no answer. Take it or leave it. And when you do that, it's great because yeah. people are like, but, but here's, and you're like, no, I don't think you understand. Like I got two minutes left. I said, it's deal or no deal. And they would be like, well, God, I, I guess deal. And some of them could never compute that. Yeah. Some of these guys, Russians and stuff, they'd be like, let's go party. Let's go do some cocaine. Let's go do that with these girls. And I'd be like, I'd be like no, you, you, you just don't understand. It's a, it's a, it's a 100% deal here. You know, yeah. it's, it's all in another. And so he, I loved how he worked business. And he taught me a lot and ended up, ended up getting in the crypto game, ended up doing a lot of trades, a lot of negotiations. What I mean, these negotiations with Russians and fucking who, <laughs> who, who knows else who, for what? Because, like, so, I mean, he's an antivirus guy, right? Like, that's how, that's the McAfee antivirus thing or the Norton or what. 
Yeah, so so he created the the antivirus. Told me he took it out of the sky like the Matrix and put it on a piece of paper. He probably created the virus, man, and then created the antivirus. Yeah. I don't know. The guy was a genius madman, right? And but he was known for a lot of. He was not known for a lot of things, but he did a lot of things. Like he's one of the main proponents in creating the eye messaging. He was uh, uh, big with NASA. Uh, all the train. Uh, systems that you know today, all the train track, extremely complex switching and all that. Uh, he was a, a major person in that until the, he, he was on a big acid-induced uh, drug high and they kicked him out. But he he worked all that programming and stuff. And he was, he was programming computers the size of houses, right? Uh, for NASA and Apollo mission. And so um, he was extreme. He was a Brilliant guy, and he was going through um, all this stuff and, and pretty much uh, taught me everything that he could during that time. And these Russian oligarchs, we would go to Ibiza. We would go all over Thailand. We traveled all over, partied with, I mean, the parties were endless. Um, and, of course, there were women and drugs and, and everything you can imagine in between. Uh, he didn't have much of a, a leash for that. He didn't have much of a tolerance for that. So he kept me on point uh, for the most part, um, and I really and I really looked up to him. You know, what, what were the uh, negotiations? Can you share any of like what what you're negotiating? I mean, were they business deals? Yeah. Were, I mean, but like what kind of business? So we would he would go as a keynote speaker. He'd get paid to be a keynote speaker, like a hundred grand, right? He we would go on a, a cruise or a blockchain technology cruise or a crypto conference everywhere Dallas Texas big ones right he would get paid to go there I would go with him as his right as his right hand man uh, well one day I was just his bodyguard you know uh, and then one day he just said hey son you're gonna be my lead negotiator you understand from this point on I said sir you got the wrong guy like no no Unless, he said you know just do what I tell you and so it was kind of nerve wracking at first but when we'd go to these meetings he would have twenty. 30, 40 different teams with all kinds of different technologies, blockchain technology, this, apps, applications, this, certain medical devices, m medical apps, you know, all these different, that they were all in line with cryptocurrency back, right, coins, right? And, uh, and uh, some of the, a lot of over-the-top stuff, a lot of fake stuff. And my job was to just, Tell you his terms, negotiate the terms, tell tell these people, hey, it's 20%. Payment is done every 24 hours, not every week, not every two weeks. He wants cash or he wants crypto, Ethereum sent to him every 24 hours. If you miss a payment, the deal's off, right? And these and these terms generally revolved around him marketing them, him, them. Because he had about a million followers on Twitter at his height, and 75% of his following basically did exactly what he said which is in, in i mean yeah think about the it's numbers cult, there. it's cult like it's cult like yeah and so he didn't have to tell you to go invest in something I got like jordan watches well wears nikes he doesn't yeah. tell you he's getting paid to, you just know he's getting paid yeah. well mcafee was in a similar boat where he wouldn't even tell you to invest in the coin he just would say hey i chose this coin you can choose that coin and leave it up to you. Well, of course, yeah. everybody's going to go with his coin, yeah, with his stuff. Yeah, crazy party stories. Sounds like you partied pretty fucking hard. Pretty hard, you know. But that didn't come till kind of later, you know. When I first got there, I was super locked on. But you basically assimilate to whatever crowd you're around, right? Yeah. And so at first, I really looked down on the guys for drinking and like with their weapons on, like playing with, I was like, what the heck? This is don't, this don't work in the teams, man. And so I was really adamant against that. And then McPhee started, he taught me how to make the perfect glass of scotch, you know, single malt liquor, right? And he offered it to me. And I thought, you know, everything he did was a test. So I, I denied it a bunch of times, but eventually I started drinking with him, you know, and then started doing his negotiations. One of my first big, crazy experiences with that is the first time we went on this big cruise overseas and i think we were going to thailand and uh, these two russian guys went up to john mcafee said hey uh mr mcafee we have a great proposition for you and he said well this is the boss right here and they're like looked at me like who the heck is this guy <laughs> and i'm like what you know yeah. and john mcafee said this is my lead negotiator uh, negotiator 
He said, uh, whatever he says goes. His word is my word. I don't want anything to do it. McAfee didn't want to deal with this BS anymore, man. He had been around a long time. And so he had gave me his parameters. So I go over there by myself. My first negotiation, these guys are at a bar. They're like, hey, before we begin with you, Mr. Boss, um, <laughs> we want to show you something very special. And I said, let's see it, brother. You know, and they, they pull out a phone and they've got all these hot women on there and they're scrolling through. You say, see all of these women? They are yours. And I said, really? I said, are you serious? And, and you know, falling hook, line and sinker, man. <laughs> First negotiation, just total yeah. novice, you know, stupid. And, uh, and they were like, there's going to be a crazy party. Whatever you want. We're going to get a mega. You see this yacht? They show me a yacht when we get in Thailand, in the port. And then we will do the negotiation on the yacht, right? And uh, this is for big money. And I said, hold on, hold on. I said, can I see your phone real quick? And they said, sure, boss. And, uh, you know, whatever you want. And so I get their phone, and I run back and go find John McAfee. I want to share this good news with him. I'm like, dude, this is great. And so John McAfee's taking a piss in the bathroom. And I go in there, and I said, sir, I got to show you something. And he's peeing. He goes, what, son? And uh, he's got his back towards me. I said, I got to show you something when you're done. So he gets done, doesn't wash his hands, walks right up to me. He said, what? And I said, sir, look at this. This Russians want to give me all this when we get to port. I don't know what I was thinking. I show him this stuff. He slapped me so hard. He slaps me in the face. Phone, Russian phone flies across the bathroom. Keep in mind, he didn't wash his hands. This is philosophical right here, guys. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, don't ever do that again. Don't ever mix women, drugs, and partying with business. You better get your mind right, boy, son. And I, from that point on, I was dangerous in negotiations. I was a full-blown businessman. And uh, I took that, and I took everything he said, you know, to the bank. And so I went over to him. I said, no deal, guys. Sorry, man. They said, like, what do you mean, boss? And I said, I, I, I don't play that game, you know. And so every, every negotiation, negotiation after that was highly, highly successful. Big turnover rate because I didn't mix drugs, I didn't mix alcohol, and I didn't mix the women with any business whatsoever. And uh, and a lot of a lot of dealings were with the Russians, and so a lot of times they would bring this beautiful girl or whatever with them, and I'd say, "Who is this?" And uh, now I was straight level. You know, he. You know, sometimes we need men to just level us up. You know, yeah. masculinity bestows masculinity. Iron sharpens iron only at the right angle. So, so McAfee sharpened me up and leveled me up with that slap. Like, I, I, I had no reaction to that because he was right. And when you get slapped and you're in the wrong, you just take your slap. And so every negotiation after that, I was like, who's this woman? And they'd be like, you know, if she's, if she's part of the negotiation, if she's the CEO, uh, let's talk. You know, let's do the same negotiation deal. But if she's there as some kind of side piece to distract me or eye candy or whatever she is, I don't want nothing to do with it. And they had never dealt with this before because because yeah. that's a big challenge when you're making a lot of money in your, in your um, proposition with these certain aspects. And so after that, I was clean cut, squared away, AJ, and highly, highly successful doing that uh, position. Yeah. What, uh, when you say big money, can you disclose even if it's a range? Like what, what kind of money are you talking about? Yeah, so, so we were doing uh, negotiations all the time. And I, I would generally get twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in negotiation like, uh, for part of my percentage, my commission. I mean, like the deal. With, like, is it tens of millions, hundreds of millions? Some, well, like hundreds of thousands? There, of there was a couple different deals, okay? Like one was uh, selling um, an ICO. Uh, service uh, selling one of their one of their uh, business where, where they were raising crowdfunding money right and a percentage of everything that came in after John McAfee started speaking about that uh, and John McAfee one of his negotiation pieces was well continue what you're doing and see how that works out for a while if if you're ready to step it up and really see change then bring me in watch what happens after I just mention you barely one time and based off of that you're going to give me 40 percent of of what comes in every single day paid in ethereum or bitcoin okay. so they're they're essentially paying for his influence over paying his. for his marketing paying for his influence <clears throat> paying for his backup and part of that was a very in-depth inve investigation review of white papers i've read hundreds 
thousands maybe I've scanned of white papers, you know, going through white papers, investigating them, like all this stuff. And I made mistakes down the road. I made mistakes along the way. Like, like you know, sometimes you can't uh, um, tell if they're, they're that fake. So we hired a team to really go in depth. We hired two teams to make sure the other team wasn't invested in them, you know, all these countermeasures. And we would find these uh, uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology uh, companies to um, uh, that they would pay John McAfee hundred thousand dollars a tweet. Uh, they would pay twenty five to forty five percent of their uh, revenue and share that with John McAfee daily. And they could be making a hundred Ethereum uh, every day or so, and one Ethereum's seven hundred dollars. And so you can imagine that was a very lucrative uh, business. Yeah. And that was just one of the aspects. I got you. Always Ethereum? Uh, th uh, no, they would be selling their cryptocurrency, but paying in Ethereum. I mean, he always preferred Ethereum over he, anything else. He, prefer he preferred Ethereum. He would take Bitcoin, yeah. but he liked the Ethereum. And, and we had accumulated thousands of Ethereum, yeah. thousands at 700. Because I mean, it's at like, what, 34, 3,500 now? Yeah, Something and like and when we started out, it was when I started with McAfee, it was just a couple hundred bucks, maybe less than that. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned that his security guys were kind of fucking cowboys. He brought you in and kind of threw you right at the top over them. Did that make them salty? And who the fuck were these guys? Did they have? Were there other soft guys, or were they just fucking loose cannons? Yeah, he said they were all at Green Beret, but when I got there, they were not. They weren't. One guy was uh, supposedly he was a Green Beret and I think even Apache pilot. He just showed me some pictures of that. So I believed him. Um, did I have a reason not to believe that? Um, but the way they acted, I, I couldn't blame them because it just didn't seem like they had the expertise in training. And one of the things that John saw about me is uh, the way I carried myself, the way I presented myself, my professionalism. I stood up a lot. I stood around him. I was always watching. Uh, he would put us through a lot of tests. Like, And, you know, guy was a brilliant strategist, Art of War, Marcus Aurelius, philosophical dude. Like, it was serious. Like, at one point, he was like, Jimmy, he woke me up at 2 a.m. 2 a. in the morning, brought me up to the top of the stairs, said, you see that? A black car that keeps driving by. And um, I'm like, yeah, I, I just saw it drive by. He said, what do you think? I said, it could be just a black car. He says, what, you don't think they're following me? And I'm like, I didn't say that, sir. I'm just saying, like, uh, I, I'm just telling you the truth that I know. And then he said, well, you see that flat? There's a flashing light, a blinking light that keeps blinking over and over, way off in the distance. And, and I'm like, you know, coming from a sniper background, all this stuff, I'm like straining my eyes. I'm trying to see, I'm trying to believe it, right? And he said, do you see that? And I said, no, sir, I don't. And he, he looked at me like I was crazy, like, how dare you? And then he looked at the other guys. He said, do you guys see that? And they were like, absolutely, sir. I absolutely see it. And I'm going, come on, guys. Like, let's be real for once. And a couple of days later, McAfee pulled me to the side. He said, remember that flashing light, son? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, I knew it wasn't there either. He goes, you're a real deal, aren't you? I said, <laughs> I said, Phew. you know, <laughs> that's pretty. Uh, I mean, it, it's ingenious, but it's also fucking kind of sketchy. You know, I mean, I, I get why you'd want to do that. The people that, you know, to see if you can trust them or not, or if they're just yes men. But uh, it, to me, that there's a there's an element of that that would make me be like, fuck, man, I don't know about this guy. You know, that just doing that kind of shit. Because, I mean, how long had you been with him at that point? Oh, uh, just a couple weeks, maybe okay. a week, bro. Yeah, and, and I guess that makes sense. Then, um, were, were were there any other tests uh, that stick out in your mind as uh, equally impactful? Yeah, one of the most impactful tests that he did with me was he paid us in cash at the end of the week, and he didn't seem to count the bills. He would pull out a stack, but I don't know if he had been dealing with money so long he just knew exactly how much it was but he'd pull out a just a stack a rack and he would pay the guys out thousands each week so i mean he's paid each guy 250 dollars me 50 uh or 500 a day and at the end of each week on sunday he would come around us little kids would gather around dad and he would deal out the the money and very accurately like Ch -ch 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 for you Ch -ch 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 for you that's your week pay he's a mathematician by trade and so the first time he did it i came back in my room i didn't want to do it in front of me but i laid out all the bills you know big money for me i laid out all the bills on the on the on the bed and i counted it and it was 100 bucks over and so i immediately racked it all back up 
brought him the hundred dollars, and and he said, "What the hell is this?" And he's always drinking, always smoking, but never drunk. He's always drinking, like Irish guy. He said, "What the hell is this?" And I said, "Sir, you overpaid me a hundred dollars." He said, "I don't care about that. Get out of here. Don't come at me again like that." I said, "Roger that, sir. Go back, put it away." Next week comes around, he does the same thing, exact same thing. Overpays me a hundred bucks. I I go count it on my bed. Come back to him, and he's he's busy. I don't. I'm kind of like, do I do this again? Like I don't want to do this. And I went up to him. I said, "Sir, I hate to say this, but man, you overpaid me by a hundred bucks. I know you." And he and he looked at me and he snatched it out of my hand. He said, "That's what I thought, son." <laughs> and I was like, Christ. "Dang, you know." So so always integrity. And he was yeah. doing that a crawl, walk, run to see if I could handle. Multi-million dollar business deals. If, if he could trust you. If he could really. trust me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you did that for about two years. What was the beginning of the end? Like, how did it end up going south? God, he, he just... McAfee, always something going on, like a, like a real reality show. Like, I remember, you know, being stressed out, running the business, you know, day and night, never telling me to wrench it back. And if he told you to wrench it back, you wrench it back. If you didn't, you just kept going hard. And I remember like two in the morning, a guy coming to the house, banging on the door, trying to come in. Of course, I'm carrying. I have to draw on him, slam him to the ground. Cops come. Always something like that going on. One time I show up to the house. The one time I left him, I took Janice McAfee, his wife, to the airport. I come back two hours later in Roanoke, and he's sleeping in the back. And I and I. And I look in his bedroom. I go, where's Sean? Like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, he was partying all day, and now he's sleeping. I look, and he's butt naked, and just he's breathing real weird and hard. I was like, what the, what the heck? And um, so I go to sleep on the couch, and we always slept very in close proximity. He, 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 he felt real comfortable around me and could sleep and stuff. So, and Janice always said that. And he looked at me at like a son at that point. And so I was always real concerned about him. I cared about the guy. Even though he had a super weird past and stuff, I didn't believe in it because that's not what I saw of John. Now, he had a dark past in the, in the beginning, in the end, but that's not what I saw. And so the next day I wake up and I hear this, uh, like that and I and I wake up and I, I go to the door and I creep, creep the door open and he's black and blue from his waist up just black and blue and I knew man it looked like he had drowned or something like bad you know from my past it looked like he had suffocated or something and I I knew he was pretty much dead so I like lift him off the bed CPR call like yell scream you know get him medevac to the hospital doctors can't find any drugs in him they're baffled he dies for like pretty much three days. He's on life support. I got the pictures, like total life support, tubes coming out of his mouth at the hospital. Nobody knows what happened. He swears he's been poisoned by the Russians. You don't know what to believe. All this chaos and paranoia and wacky stuff and um, just builds panic and pandemonium. And he, and he liked chaos, you know? He would invite the enemy into his house, basically. And uh, I one time I took him to the side and I said, John, sir, why, why do you invite these people into your house? It makes it chaotic. I mean, can't you see the guy's going to rob you? Can't you see the guy's going to rob us blind? I mean, I'm not trying to sow discord here, but it just, I mean, it's very obvious, this guy, right? And he took me to the back. I'll never forget it. And he was looking at me with that smoking cigarette. And he said, son, he said, um, I allow people to come into my life and I allow them to build a cage around themselves slowly because it allows me to see them. And I said, I allow them to work painstakingly hard at building that cage around them. And once they're finished building the cage, I simply walk up, put the key in the door, and lock it and walk away. And after he said that, I was like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. It's kind of eerie, kind of kind of hair stand up on your, your, your arms. And so after that, I just kind of trusted it and uh, kept running and gunning with the, with, the, with the negotiations. It got bigger and bigger, traveling all the time. But always in a state of paranoia, always moving, moved up to Roanoke, moved up to Ocracoke, you know, overlooking the sound there, and living in a mansion the, sh the size, the, the shape, shape of a ship, like the Love Boat series, living there. And I knew it was the beginning of the end. You're with him pretty much 24-7. 24-7, man. Yeah. Moved six times in a period of like a year. And, and at this point, was he still paying you 500 a week? No, day, sorry. no, it was, it was like, Hey, I, I told him, I told him, sir, stop paying me 500 bucks a day. 
It's it's ridiculous. He gave me he gave me half his gold and silver one day. You know, he put me through a lot of stuff. Like one time, he said, "Son, come back here. I want to show you something." And he he valued interpersonal human connections. You know, he he really wanted the he wanted some love or something. You know, he wanted like some kind of relationship, true friendship, true friendship. He had nobody, and he had a lot of dark secrets. A lot of dark secrets. The FBI later told me, Jimmy, this guy was evil. And we, we understand now. You didn't know about this. You didn't know how bad it could because I didn't know that guy. But he's got a bad rap in a lot of areas, right? And so one day he called me in the back of his room. And um, he said, son, check this out. He threw me a piece of silver like this, you know, like an ounce of silver. And I don't know what it is. I don't know how much it's worth. I'm thinking, man, this thing's worth a lot of money. And uh, it's like 75 bucks or something. Who knows? Like 25. Yeah, 25. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got it. And uh, he throws it to me. He says, you like this? And I said, sir, I love this. This is, this is great. He says, well, you can keep that. And I said, man, I'll never forget this. Because, I mean, I was, I was really appreciative. Because, I mean, you got to think. I come from, you know, all this stuff and that happened in the teams, and then I get out, not knowing what I'm going to do. Now I have direction again. Now I have purpose again. Now I have this validation, even though it's kind of fake, whatever. I have all this stuff going on. And so he throws me this piece of silver. I'm like, I'll never give this away. I'll never, I'll never forget this. And I, I started walking out of the room. He said, hey, son. He says, uh, because, because you said that, because you cherish that, um, I'm going to give you half of all my gold and silver. And I... I was like, damn. I was like, that, that hit me hard because it, he, that's how much he, he cared about loyalty, about uh, friendship, like you said, um, and kind of like that son-father relationship. And so he gave, he gave me half of his gold and silver. Which was how much? It was, it was ungodly. It was I mean, tons. Like hundreds of thousands? Hundreds of thousands. Holy shit. And, uh, and of course, I lost a lot of that and um, because we had a really messed up breakup. We had a... We had a, we 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 came to an end. All good or bad things come to an end road, and it when things are good too good to be true, you know it's probably is it's it is yeah. it is it, it doesn't last forever. But it can make you it can it can give you a false sense that that everything's go, go okay when you know it's really not. And so um, there was a point where, uh, you know, I drank a. Uh, one of his guys gave me a scotch, and I started drinking it. And um, late at night, I was working. And then all of a sudden, it's like my world flipped upside down. And later on, when I did mushrooms and went on a sabbatical with my girl and went to Koh Phangan and Koh Samui and lived in Thailand doing Muay Thai, I tried a lot of different stuff, and it reminded me of that. I had never done psychedelics before that, but it reminded me of an LSD trip, like a bad one. And... Uh, um, man, I, I, I just, I ran out of the house. I drank this scotch and now I'm like, I ran out of the house, hid in the woods, uh, heard these machine guns going off, had like the worst freaking trip of my life, man. Came back. Uh, it's one of the coldest times I've ever had in my life. It was in North Carolina. I was in a swamp hiding like this for the whole night. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And I was hiding. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy to admit this, but I, hey, it's whatever. And I, I went there, and it was a very scary time. And I knew that somebody messed with me. I knew, but it was so real. It wasn't like I was seeing things, but I was hearing stuff, auditory stuff. But I was hiding in this swamp, and I was like, and I was not coming out. I was a wild thing. I was an animal. I was not human during that time. For the whole night, for 24 hours, I was not coming out. They were looking for me, and I was hiding like this in a swamp, just freezing yeah. like like buds hell week freezing yeah. and but i wasn't coming out i would rather die in that swamp than come out and i eventually came out the next day looked like the prodigal son man covered in mud came back home in shame and i said and i went up to him i said what i said what'd you do to me and he said son son what's going on i said don't act like that shit i said i know you did something to me john i said just admit it i said i don't I, all i care about is truth i don't care about anything else in this world, I just don't want to be lied to. I said, if you did something to me, then just tell me right now. He was like, no, no, son, I would never do anything. And I said, man, I said, then it's over between me and you because I know and you know. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he tried to give me a bunch of pills. And I knew from the past that those were those reversed 
the, the side effects of big, hard drugs and psychedelics, he carried those around. I can't remember what they're called, but he had talked about them before, and he tried to give them to me. And I said, well, why are you trying to give me something? You don't even know what happened to me. You don't know if I had a mental break- breakdown. And I knew, I, w- I knew it wasn't a mental breakdown. I knew that somebody gave me to something. And he later admitted to my ex, who was basically running the company on the side, doing all of his trades and stuff for a commission. I brought her in because she was financially capable. Uh, she was uh, uh, like an accountant. And uh, he later admitted to my ex that, yeah, he was messing with me. And, and if you look at his past, he would do weird stuff as another big test. But he admitted he had pushed the envelope too far. And so, do you know what he gave you? I have no idea, yeah. but I know you know you know you. Yeah. And if you just like we're in here one day, everything's going. You're making you don't you don't. It's not drug induced, like in the sense that I'm voluntarily doing stuff. Because if I was, um, you can't make you don't make big business deals like that. You can't keep a business running like that. Yeah. I was perfectly sound mind, drank the scotch, and now I'm in a swamp for 24 freaking hours, yeah. hearing machine guns. You know. Freaking out, threw my gun, you know, I was, I, I was out of my mind. And then that's when I, I was like, well, I'm out. And so he says, you, he goes, you, you, you know, you're going to leave me holding the bags like this? Because I was running everything. I had everything. I had Bentleys. I had boats. I had houses. I had everything. I was making 20, 30 grand a day, you know, like a lot, you know, for me. And, uh, but it all came crashing down. And uh, reality came back and hit me in the face, you know. I lost, I lost my way there anyway, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter the scotch. didn't matter the drugs. I lost my way. So he took all that shit back from you, or you gave it back, or what? Yeah, so, so I didn't care about the Bentley. I didn't, I care, I didn't care about the $750,000. I, I really didn't care about that stuff. It was weird. And maybe that's easier said when you have it all, like, oh, whatever, I don't care. But at the time, I didn't really care about it. Uh, I really cared about the principal things and truth. And so, and I left... The gold and silver, it, it, that was all left at the office. I just left yeah. with, no, with nothing. And um, he, he was like, um, I called him. I said, sir, I just, man, I, I just want you to do the right thing. You, you owe me 30% of, of a bunch of stuff. You still owe me a bunch of money. I said, but listen, I don't care about a lot of this stuff. I got, I, got, I got some funds and stuff from this thing. I said, but just remember, I got all your cars in my name. I got the house. I got all this stuff. And, and so I said, I'm going to transfer this over to you right now. I said, but please do the right thing and send me, send me the gold that you gave me for my, you know, it was a gift. Uh, if, you, if you feel like it's, um, if it's the right thing to do or, or whatever you want, right? And uh, he's like, son, you've played the fool. Oh, oh and, I, and I even kind of threatened him. I said, I said, and if you don't, brother, I said, don't don't forget, I have all your stuff. I have all your stuff, but I didn't want his stuff. I wanted the stuff that that was truthfully given to me, uh, that I that I was uh, owed. And uh, he said, "Son, you've played the fool." And I knew when he said that, I'm like, "This guy don't lose. You know, you don't threaten John McAfee because he's going to win every single freaking time." And so I knew I didn't know what he could do, but I knew that by way of him saying that, he had a no bluff policy, which I developed too. Like, hey. Don't ever bluff. Just don't have a, you know, what you say is what you mean. And so he said, son, you played the fool. And I said, okay. I said, what have you done? He says, well, you know your beautiful princess wife, right? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. He said, well, as she signed a power of attorney over to me, uh, and uh, I've taken everything back. She signed everything back to me. And I I felt super betrayed, you know, because a lot of it was my stuff that she signed back over to him. And, And so I felt super that, that was one of the most betraying moments in my life. I was like, oh, my God. And, and so that was hard to deal with. Uh, and uh, he says, but I'm going to do, do what I believe is fair. And so he sent me, you know, some of the gold and silver, you know, you know some of the crypto he owed me. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I wasn't, like, stingy like that. I was like, all right, fair enough. I didn't want that ugly Bentley anyways. It was kind of ugly, but yeah, blue. That's a fucking trip, man. So you left. Yeah. Um, and then he shit came crashing down for him, and then the FBI showed up, or how did how did all that transpire? Yeah, so so man, you talk about just after after going through what I did with everything, Mike, um, and then having this 
uh, what seemed like this beautiful fake miracle happened, maybe done like from the dungeon to the palace, all this stuff, you know, rising like this. Um, and then having this major breakup with John McAfee and losing a good friend in it, losing a great guy, like like that, that father's type son thing. I, I just, after that, man, I knew, like, man, life ain't doing so well for Jimmy Watson. Like, I, I'm just lost, man. And so I'm just going to go do me. I'm going to go um, do, I'm going to go on a sabbatical. I had a lot of money. Uh, and so I decided to just travel the world, go selling in Spain, get all my level certs, you know, leveled up and certifications with selling, uh, just live an adventure, adventurous life. Um, but um, as I was doing that, I heard all of a sudden John McPhee got arrested. And I was like, oh, man. Like, oh, dude. Did your, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but did your ex-wife stay on with him? My ex-wife stayed on with him for uh, like another year or so. No, I'm sorry. She stayed on with him several more months. And um, uh, that was hard, you know, to just total. And, you know, something John McAfee told me, he said, Jimmy, you know why you get hurt uh, in life? And, I, and he didn't even know me at the time, but he knew me. Like, he didn't know you, but he just seemed to know everything. He knows people. He knows people. He said, Jimmy, you know why you get hurt? And I said, why, sir? Like, he goes, because you lift people up on a pedestal so high that finally they're so high above you that eventually they fall down and they, and they crush you with their weight. I never forgot that. And it was true. And he says, you know that your pretty wife? I said, yeah. I said, leave my wife out of this. He's like, well, he says, you can't trust her. And I said, Sir, that's one person you got wrong, brother. I said, you've been right about everything. I will admit that. Everything you say, everything you do is right. He never loses. And um, I said, but, th but that one is wrong. And, and, and unfortunately, it became true. Uh, I mean, I have my own, like when I hear you say that, there's one thing I think about why he would say that to you. Did something happen between the two of them? No, it wasn't like that. I mean, how how he, did he? He was of, like a he was like a father figure to her too, and he was an he was a, a brilliant manipulator, mm. and he brought people in, um, perhaps allowed him to build a cage around himself. In Leah's situation or my ex wife's situation, uh, he brought her in, and uh, I I brought her in right as like the accountant for all this stuff for all this finances and stuff. And there was rapport and trust built there. And uh, he was just an excellent manipulator. And he was just telling me when I first met him, like a, a week into meeting him, like you can't even trust your wife. I, I don't Maybe it was self-fulfilled prophecy of me yeah. believing. But, it, you know, there was some truth to that, you know. How, uh, when you left and she stayed on, is that, is that, was that the catalyst of you guys getting divorced? Or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. But I, 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 I need to make it clear here, you know. I don't want to ever sound like I'm deflecting in, in saying, woe is me, or like it was them, it was them. Man, I, I, I had it coming. And like I told the FBI when they arrested me eventually, um, I said, you know, I may not understand these charges here, but, you know, I, I've done plenty in my life to deserve this. Yeah. Like, I, it's, it's, I'm guilty, you yeah. know. Well, so how did you get from when you left – everything shakes out with, with your ex and him and, and what have you, and you go decide to do you, how did it lead up to you getting arrested? Yeah, so I go on this sabbatical overseas. I hear John McAfee got arrested, and I just knew. My parents were like, you know, the FBI is like leaving notes on the door, coming by the house, and I, I just knew, you know. And, and when you're on the run like that, uh, you, you just know, like, you just know before you go on the run that you've been on the run. Did you, I mean, were you intentionally fleeing? Yeah. You were. I was, I was intentionally fleeing uh, everything. Like, yeah. I, let me put it like this. I was not answering their mail. Yeah. And so they look at that as me running from them. I, I was not going to come back to the U.S. and face anything because I had already dealt with the FBI with the Blackwater thing. And to me, having hung myself in a, in a, in a hospital um, and, and all this stuff and already fighting, I didn't have it in me to fight these guys again. 
And I, I couldn't even imagine what it was for at the time. I really didn't know what it was for, but I knew since they arrested McAfee and now they're, they want to talk to me, I wasn't going to be answering no mail. And uh, I wasn't going to be playing that game. And it, it, it obviously came full circle against me. Yeah. And so, so I, I was running from myself, brother. I was running from God, from everything in my life. And I always say that, that God's in every dark corner because I've been to some dark places, brother. In that two years, man, that's when I went off the deep end. Was doing cocaine and Medi and Columbia, doing all kinds of like super crazy stuff. So uh, that's after McAfee. You, you go down to Columbia and you're doing mercenary work and cocaine and crazy shit. Cocaine, cocaine, mercenary work, and, and uh, Tom's cocaine, man. What was the gist of the mercenary work? Well, I started out in, in Columbia. I just flew to Columbia on a whim. I made some contacts uh, and then flew to, was based out of Medellin, Columbia. Let me, let me take one quick back step. How do you make contacts in Columbia? Brother, <laughs> I mean, what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> Man, I, I, I was resourceful, you know? Yeah. I was very resourceful my whole life. And, uh, and when, I, when I determined what I was going to do, I was like, I ain't playing no more game. I'm going to make the big bucks, you know, in mercenary work. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my feelers out. I'm going to call some boys in the teams and feel around. And, and they're going to make some con- – they made some connections. And finally, I made a, a – a good connection. I want to be very cautious when I say good on this show. You know, ain't, yeah. ain't nothing good about it because you can find yourself in some dark places like I did. And so I'm in Medellin, Colombia now, and I'm just, I'm going all out because I, I have a death wish, bro. I, I had a death wish in there. I didn't, like you, you didn't know, give a shit about anything. I didn't give a shit about anything, man. Like three day coke binge, just dr- drugs, drinking prostitutes you name it yeah yeah uh, as far as prostitutes go though and um, you know the fbi asked me that they were like you how, you know you were you with prostitutes and i was like yeah and, and no and they were like what the heck does that mean and and uh i said well i was like because uh, they were asking me about being on the run and stuff and they finally got me and i said well you know i was the type of guy that i just wanted human contact i, w- I wanted to speak to people I wanted. I didn't care who it was. I wanted to hang out with people and talk to them because I was a lonely guy. I was like running for like running from everything. So you just wanted the company. I wanted the company, and so what I would do is I'd go out and uh, get a bunch of girls, you know, because they always had the drugs. That they'd come over, and uh, we would just hang out. And by the time you party all night like that and hang out, you ain't doing nothing at the end of the night. Yeah. You ain't doing nothing. Passing out. I don't care what anybody says. And so that was my routine a lot of times. And it was a dark time. You know, it was a dark time because there's come downs from that. And there's a there's a sense of just just being lost. You're walking dead, man, with a death wish. And um, so I took I took anything that came up, man. So you were taking all kinds of drugs? Uh, I mostly I would always start out with alcohol and then I would go into cocaine or whatever came across me they, they had some other stuff 2cb or something and i didn't like that um were you trying like any heroin or meth or anything that, that no kind of but but i didn't but i didn't i didn't like i didn't even like the cocaine it was weird it was like it made you feel jacked up maybe good at first and then it just was a, just a terrible slippery slippery slope um but it, it really just fueled it was just a means to drink more alcohol mm. it was a a way for me to drink more alcohol. Like it would sober you up, kind of? Yeah, sober you up, I guess, in, in a way. Yeah. So Sober you up maybe relative to, to, to how much you're drinking. Yeah. And uh, But I, I had tried everything, brother. Not heroin, but I had tried meth. I, I tried everything, man. Wow. Wow, what was meth like? Meth just was uh, super – I remember doing meth for the first time, and I was like – Bro, I was like, whoa, what is this? And, you know, having these conversations on it, you know, and you think you're just philosophical, deep conversations. And maybe they are, you know, because maybe it hits a certain wavelength in your brain. Yeah, wavelength in your brain, a certain energy comes out. And, you know, at first you're super high, but then you realize all of a sudden, oh, my God, like the time that's gone by, the sun's coming up, and now I have this terrible feeling that I'm coming down. Now what do I do? Do I go through this 
gauntlet of hell to try to come down off this? Or do I, do I do another hit off the pipe? You know, do I chase the dragon again and, and go on this run again, right? And that's these, these highs and lows is what I was, it, it, these highs is what I was chasing. I wanted to squeeze the, the juice out of life going through this. And I, I saw an interview with, uh, with a meth addict that uh, I think, I've never tried it, but did an accurate, uh, or what seemed like it made sense in terms of an accurate depiction is that he said that it was a, it was a cigarette laced with, with meth and he smoked and he said the high that he got was the best he'd ever felt in his life. And every time he did it after that, it was just quite not as good. And, and he spent like the, the next several years chasing that very first time yeah, that he man. did it and could just never catch it. Is that? That's exactly what happens. I've, I've spoke to a lot of people like that. It's like the, the first time you do ecstasy. I, the first time I ever did ecstasy. The I've first, never done that either, but yeah, good, I haven't man. done shit. But. That's good, brother. Because the first time I did uh, ecstasy, the first time I did Molly, uh, all these drugs, every first time, it was like the best feeling in the world something i had been missing out on and then and then the next time was half that the next time was a quarter of that the next time you're like this stuff is fake He's this stuff is bs and then after that you're not even you never ever get a, even a fraction of that anymore yeah. of any of that stuff anymore and, and even in copious amounts of yeah, you're, you're just trying okay. to, to feel somewhat normal by keeping the withdrawals and bullshit away. Yeah, yeah. but I, man, I'll tell you what, I was, I was the kind of guy that I, I wasn't necessarily addicted. It was like I, I could do it for three days straight, get off of it for a couple weeks, go operate, do some crazy stuff, come back for a few nights, for a few, for a week or so, and then go back on another big run, you know, yeah. party and party, party. Cause I wanted, I wanted the experience of everything. I wanted to experience everything I could. Um, and a lot of it was not taking responsibility and just not taking like, like, Hey man, Jimmy, you're, you're messed up, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Some really bad things happen to you, you know? Okay. Bad things happen to people, but you don't have to. You don't have to live in the past, and I was living in the past, and just and what that does those drugs is it's a total waste of time. Time being the most valuable thing we have, but the biggest thing for me was it makes you reminisce about the past when you're supposed to be thinking about the future, thinking about great things ahead of you, and in 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 goals and achieving the things. and And I look at those as wasted years, man. Yeah. Wow. You mentioned uh, you'd go do some crazy shit when you were off of it, i.e. the mercenary work. Uh, what, what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, so so I, I made those contacts, man, uh, with a good friend of mine in, uh, in the teams. And, um, and uh, you know, we, we spoke, and, you know, it was like no names, no, 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 uh, no written stuff, just, just a little bit of speaking back and forth. And he was like, hey, check it out. Uh, come to, uh, come to uh, Nicaragua. And uh, I'll give you 10 G's just to come hear what we got to say. And if you don't want to do it, take the 10 G's cash and go back to Columbia. And just never, we'll never, we'll never talk about it again. I said, all right, sounds good, you know, whatever. And so I jump on an airplane. Well, first he, he gives me specific instructions. He's like, um, you know, first I want you to go to San Salvador and go to this hotel he said, just, just don't ask questions, man. Just don't ask any questions. And I'm like, that's kind of hard to do, man. It's extremely hard to get these kind of directions and go, yeah, but what if this happens? But, okay, okay. And he's like, go to this hotel in, in, in San Salvador, El Salvador, uh, and uh, you're going to ask the, the hotel guy for um, the keys to a silver suitcase sounds like some movie I'm, I'm telling you this is no joke <laughs> i know i know and people were like yeah whatever so silver suitcase and uh he says um and uh go back and there's a storage room and they've got these suitcases and just get the silver suitcase out and and, and, and the key will work and, and put the key in and then you're going to open it there's about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in there not a specific amount take 10 grand out that's it and uh, close it, lock it, put it back in there, and then get back on the airplane and come to Nicaragua and, uh, and hear what we have to say. If you don't like it, bounce. 
And so I go to this hotel in El Salvador, man. I'm just like, is this a setup? Am I about to get arrested? But, you know, you have paranoia, man, out of the roof. And This and, is a guy you trusted. Yeah, big time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I go there, and, um, and I ask for this silver suitcase, this, this uh, keys, this silver. He, he hands them to me. He goes and gets the silver suitcase. I'm, like, nervous, kind of sweating. I'm like, ah, you know, like, because like, it just don't seem right, you know? And I'm like, what's in this suitcase? And so I, I get this suitcase out, bring it to my room, and I put the keys in, and it, and it just, the key kind of barely goes in. It won't work. I'm like, I'm like man, am I crazy? And I, and I like spend like the next 30 minutes putting this key in like this. It's silver. I'm like, and I text him. I'm like, hey, man, my bad, bro. Because you don't want to look like some Dip rookie, yeah. a rookie mercenary here, you know? And, you know, new, newbie. And so I'm like, hey, bro, check it out. I got the silver, you know, silver suitcase. I said, but man, that key don't work. He's like, he's like, don't bullshit me, man. He said, that key works. He said, that's the wrong suitcase. I said, it ain't the wrong suitcase. It looks just like the one you sent in the picture. He said, he said, it's gotta be another one. I said, all right, man. So I'm about to break this key off in there. So I go back to the desk. I said, sir, I think I got the wrong suitcase. And you know, this guy's looking at me like, what the heck's going on here? You know, stay in for one night, get the silver suitcase. And so go back in there, find the right one. Just like you said, there's like a 100, probably 40 Gs in there with a little piece of paper where guys have been taking money out and writing their names and, you know, tick marks. And I'm like, how's he, you know, you know, it, this is some serious trust, right? And I don't want to be accused of taking more or less. So like, and it's like some scratched out numbers and stuff. It's really like bad keeping. So I took the, I took a little less than 10 grand because, you know, traveling with 10 grand, you don't want to be flagged and stuff. Um, and so go to fly to Nicaragua and um, hear what they have to say, you know? So what did they have to say? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It was like, what? And, 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 and that's it. That's the end of the story. No. So I sat down at this uh, with, with another guy and uh, two, two mercenary dudes, uh, pretty cool dudes, and, and sit down, and they tell me the story. They're like, all right, bro, here you go, man. Here's the deal. And I'm like, what could this be, you know? Like, what could this possibly be? And they're like, all right, so the ex-president of El Salvador um, has fled to Nicaragua, this communist country that we're in right now. There's like tanks at the, at, you know, on every traffic circle. If you want to buy a Snickers bar, you got to like fill out tons of paperwork to buy the Snickers bar. And I'm like, dude, get me out of here. And um, I want to go back to Medellin, you know? And, um, and so they're like, so there's an ex-president from San Salvador. He's in, he's fled the country. He lives in Nicaragua with uh, some hot TikTok girl star. Okay. Superstar. Uh, he's in a gated compound. He's got Nicaraguan attack bull, pit bulls. I didn't know even existed. Um, and I'm like, all right, so what we got to do? And they're like, well, here's the deal. Uh, the El Salvador president has new president has promised the people if he was voted in within the first six months he would <laughs> he would get this guy alive not dead but alive the other one's easy the alive one is is very difficult and so and i'm like uh okay what did this guy do you know because i don't i don't do crazy stuff i don't do like kids don't you know Guns, drugs, all that crazy stuff, you know. Um, and so, and some guys do other stuff. I don't know. I never operated with those kind of guys. This stuff is legit, you know. And so, they're like, this guy stole $300 million in what was supposed to be allocated for children's schools and stuff like that. He just stole it and, and basically did a deal with the Nicaraguan president and exiled himself to Nicaragua. But the Nicaraguan president took the money from him. Yeah. But now he lives safely in Nicaragua. It kind of... a a really crappy compound, brother. And so uh, I said, I agree to do it. Somehow we're going to get this guy alive, you know. And um, uh, and uh, so we scout out the place. We live there for like a month. And it's tedious work. We're watching him all the time. Penetration tests. You know, all kinds of different stuff. All kinds of different plans. But okay, do we go in to, to, to like I hang underneath a, a U-Haul trailer, you know, that, that's coming in every day? You know, do we subdue the guards, you know? But the problem is, is we don't have any weapons, you know? And that's a big deal. Like, how in the world are we supposed to get this president out of his house, 
How many of you are there? Three total. Okay, no weapons. What did they? Can I ask what they offered pay wise to do that? Uh, yeah, four four hundred. <laughs> four hundred grand. Yeah, each. Four hundred split between, oh, um, between the three of you. No, actually, it was four hundred each for me. Holy shit! Maybe may. It, it, there was there was other follow on work promise, but I don't like that those kind of empty promises. Yeah. But the next job was going to be to uh, em, eliminate the MS thirteen in that country, or get a get a contract with their government, and try to uh, and try to go all out against their drug cartels there, which I thought was a great gig, which I thought was going to be pretty cool. And so um, uh, we, we try to come up with all kinds of different plans with this, um, uh, getting this guy out. And, and how, do, how do you kidnap the guy? You drug him. You, you get him out of his house. And then you put him on a paddle board. And, he, and, and it was pretty dang complex. We had met with the uh, uh, officials in, in uh, El Salvador. And uh, they had coordinated with their Navy to have boats on the shore. And we were going to swim him out. You know, I mean, this is this is crazy complex, bro. A month of planning for three guys. You can do a lot with three guys in a month, you know. And so we had the guys waiting with a um, an old drug cartel drug speedboat on the on the outside doing circles every night, getting ready for us to go. Uh, but the biggest dilemma was we're in a communist country. And once we grab him and the bells go off, you just can't get caught. You just can't get caught in that country, right? And so... We did a, a long story short. We did a a, a big att attempt at it, and uh, his guards got freaked out. Saw us there. They wouldn't open the gate. We tried to open the gate, and it was a it was a bust. And I'm glad it was because when you're doing that, it, you find yourself in in things in life. If you think about it long enough, you're going to end up doing it, and those things can turn into very dark, bad things. So I was very fortunate. I was fortunate that it didn't work out, and I was glad to to be done with that after thirty days of that particular thing. Yeah, didn't didn't get paid. And got the ten grand. That's it. Yeah, left the country with ten grand minus a couple of stinkers bars. <laughs> I was like, man, this is. I, I got to pick yeah. my pick my missions. Back. Yeah. Uh, so you go back. Did you do more shit like that? Yeah, I did. I did stuff sporadically all around. I did some crazy, some, some pretty cool stuff, but nothing is like. Nothing, nothing like that because that was pretty ballsy. It was, it was the most ballsy thing you can do. Like we were talking, we were talking about like, dude, if this goes down, like this is the most ballsy. And this guy, one of them was from Damn Neck, you know. When I, you know, you know, like, this is one of the most ballsy things you could do because it's one thing to just pop a dude, but it's another uh, to um, to 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 kidnap him and get him out of a country. And the whole reason to kidnap him was to bring him to trial. For the money he stole. And so that's how I justified it, you know? Man. Uh, can you share some of the other shit that you did? That no, I, I not really knew. <laughs> no. no. I ain't that crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Uh, so how did, it, how did all that end? Did you end up just deciding to come back to the United States and face the music? Yeah, you know, John Dillager came back. The, you, know, you know, all outlaws all outlaws come home to see their mom one last time, and that's how they get killed or arrested, and... And man, I was tired of being on the run. I was, I was, you, you just wear yourself out, man. Yeah. And I was worn out in life, you know, from, from, from just going crazy and living a, I had a wild life. And so I ended up coming to face the music, but, but really I, I came home to see my mom and then I was going to go see my, my Russian girl in Bali. And uh, so I bought non extraditionary country tickets which is no such thing they just do a deal there ain't no such thing as non-extraditionary country and you know especially when you're googling it and the fbi's watching you google it and so <laughs> it's, some bad idea genes right there yeah 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 and so um so i i got i got the only thing i could think of doing was one-way tickets to bali and it was really sad man because i love america and I, I loved and all i ever wanted to do from the time i was on that little farm we talked about in texas was serve my country be a patriot, do cool things, go on an adventure, and somehow now, you know, I'm buying a one-way ticket out of America and say I'm out of my mom one last time in Dallas, Texas. And we went out for coffee. I'll never forget it. And I'm, I'm sad because I, it's going to be the last time I ever see her, my mom. And it's, a, it's terrible, man, to, to see your mom for one last time. And because and, you know it's kind of over, you know, and 
I said, Mom, I love you, you know. And uh, I got super, uh, super emotional. And, um, but this peace came across me, brother, like never before. And I said, Mom, somebody must be praying for me. I feel like everything's going to be okay. And about the time I said that, I was walking back to the car with her. And this black SUV pulls up to me. And I don't know if it's the mob or some, some bad dudes or the law or who, man, because... I mean, it pulled up to me this close. You know, people wonder how, like, mob, mob, mobsters die in public and or somebody gets shot so quick and they didn't have time to react. I It was like no reaction. Like, this SUV pulls up and this gun's in my face through the window. And the guy's saying, and he's got his door cracked open. He says, Jimmy, Watson. And I said, yeah. I just said, yeah. And I just faced him. I was like, here it goes. It's going to shoot or what? And uh, he says, you know, Put your hands on, you know, you know, put your hands up. And, and like, I'd say 15 or so FBI and Dallas SWAT came out full, full on, man. Like, full on. Like, you're the biggest danger to society in the world and got me on the ground. Right in front of your mom. Right in front of my mom. What's she doing? She, she freaking out or she, she like, said, ah, whatever. She, yeah, she, she got her phone out, you know, and she was like, well, you got the tater. You got the tater. She was saying, you got the tater. I said, Mom, stop saying you got the tater. What does that even mean? <laughs> like, stop saying that. Like, Mama Peacock up in the house. Oh, and man. she's like, she's like saying something like, Jimmy, you know this don't, you don't, this don't face him. Like, like being Holy like shit. all hard, you know, yeah. like, you know this don't face him. And I was, I was laughing about it. And I was real chill. I said, get your finger off the trigger, man, before you shoot me. Yeah, because he is shaking and, and had this. But. At the end of the day, they were super cool with me. They said, hey, man, sorry for coming in force. I said, why'd y'all come in force like that? You know, when I'm in the car like this, I got my, I got my hands, you know, handcuffed. And, and they said, why, you know, why? I said, why'd y'all come in force like that? And they're like, Jimmy, uh, all we heard was you're a SEAL. And we got the order to arrest you in full force, brother. And, uh, and you're, you're a flight risk. And I said, well, that's true. <laughs> I said, that's true. They said, how many pull-ups can you do? And they were asking me cuts something yeah. like that. I was like, take these handcuffs off and I'll show you. And they were like, nah. You know. and, and so they immediately transferred me to the same federal pen as the Tiger King was in uh, and uh, stayed for four or five days there. The only place they, ha they had was the hole. So my, my only experience with the feds was in the shoe. Really? In solitary. Huh. Yeah, because uh, of COVID and stuff, they, they were isolating guys. And they were like, sorry, brother. The only place we have for you is the shoe. I said, well, how bad could the shoe be? Poor bro. Four days down there, man, I was like, next level, man. One, one minute you're going to Bali to see your Russian girl, and next minute you're in solitary confinement. Life happens fast. Yeah. And so um, I was pacing the walls in there, you know, angry about a lot of stuff in life and just pissed off, man. And, yeah. And they transferred me to house arrest. So what uh, what came of that? I mean, did they charge you with formal charges that you can repeat? And and what, how did it all shake out? Yeah, they, they charged me with uh, the same exact felonies. I don't even know all of them that uh, that were charged with John McAfee. John McAfee's in a Spanish prison at this point, and I was the only one arrested with him. And so he was arrested, put in a Spanish prison. He was trying to bounce out to Turkey. I was trying to bounce to Bali. They arrested me. Now we're both sitting in prison. Uh I had to go in front of a Texas judge and fight my and fight the uh, because they wanted to transfer me. They said I was a flight risk and a seal, so I was danger to society. Those two factors make you put you on lockdown. And so my lawyer was good. He said, "Look, this guy served honorably. This guy's a good dude. He's not going to run. He'll sign a, a five million dollar promissory bond." So I signed a five million dollar bond, and they allowed me to go on house arrest. And but I was charged with eight felonies, the same one as McAfee, minus were, the tax evasion. Were they all financial? All financial, white yeah. collar stuff, money wire fraud. Because I sent a text to my girl saying, "Hey, can you liquidate a million bucks?" That's money wire fraud. Why or how? It's I, I don't know. You if you so so money the wire fraud from what my lawyer explained to me. I said, "What do you mean you want money wire fraud?" I've, I've heard I, I didn't do that. And, you know, he's explained to me this in my little cell, and he's like, "Jimmy, he's like you sent a text to your ex and asked her to liquidate one million dollars in crypto that John McAfee had." Since that money is uh, uh, supposedly taken in fraud, even though it's McAfee's that he took it, um, if it is, in fact, done in a fraudulent way and you facilitated that money 
across state lines being liquidated in your personal checking account, a USA, mm. you know, USAA canceled me out of that, whatever, you know, on <laughs> Veterans Day, I was like, man, what's up, guys? Come on, yeah. man. Yeah. Big patriots. And so um, they, uh, they consider that as uh, wire fraud. Huh. That was just one thing. Money, a laundry, uh, laundering money, conspiracy to commit fraud, all, all kinds of different crazy stuff that I really had to, had like the, figure out what the fuck. Yeah, I, was like, I was like, man, I, I've done some crazy stuff, but what are you talking about right now? Like what? And so anyways, I go on house arrest. I'm not transferred upstate. They want to transfer me upstate and keep me in prison. I go on house arrest, man. And I'm facing 15 years in prison, 12 to 15. My lawyer says because of the amount of money involved and because I held a leadership position as CEO of the, of the team. And so now, man, I'm facing hard time and I'm like, Life is over, you know, and uh, and so one night at 3 a.m. in the morning, I cry out. I say, God, if you're ruling my life, I know I'm going to prison. They got R2-D2 around my ankle, brother. This ankle bracelet, is there so advanced. They talk to you. You can't get them wet, thank God. You know, you can't, don't have to take baths and stuff. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know, seals don't like getting wet. And so I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, sit on house arrest. I ain't got nothing to live for, man. And so I, I cry out to God. You know, you do some serious soul searching, you know, deep searching, deep searching. And I, at 3 in the morning, I say, God, I said, if you're real, I said, man, I, I've led a life astray. I said, I, I deserve everything that's coming to me. Whether or not I did this, I did this. Whether or not I did that, I opened this door up. So I said, I, I, I take full responsibility. I, I, it's a meet with Jesus moment, you know? And so I said, I take full responsibility for everything. I said, I humble myself. I'll take my licks. I know I'm going to prison. I know you're probably not going to save me from that. I said, but I said, just, just I want to feel something. I need something. I'm, I'm lost, man. I'm, I'm super lost. And, um, and the very next day, um, this man calls me. Oh, and I said, and I told God, I said, I'll go anywhere just for just, just a couple of days, just I'll, I'll do anything. Rehab, uh, 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 somewhere. And then the very next day, on house arrest, a guy calls me and says, Jimmy? I said, yeah. He says, how are you doing? I said, not too good. He says, well, I've called you to, uh, to ask if you want to go to Operation Restore Warrior, this nonprofit veterans group. And I said, Operation Restore Warrior? And I remember I had put in a little email to them once, you know. And uh, he reached out to me. He said, you want to come? I said, man, I said, uh, I'm on serious house arrest, man. There's no way I can. He says, well, we ain't going to judge you. And so the Texas judge, uh, I, I asked the Texas judge, and he said, yeah, you're a veteran. You can go for three days, but we're going to be watching you, son. We know about you, you know, running. I said, I ain't going nowhere, man. I'm worn out. I'm done. You know, guilty as charged. And so I go to Operation Restore Warrior. And when I walk in there, um, the guy says, Jimmy, you ready to meet Jesus? I said, don't tell me that stuff, man. I said, don't give me that. I've tried everything. I baptized myself after a three-day Coke binge in Medellin, Columbia, hot tub. You know, I've done it all, man. I said, I've done the altar calls. I've prayed. I don't hear nothing. I said, uh, I, don't, I don't really believe in that stuff. And he says, well, it doesn't matter. God believes in you. Jesus believes in you. I said, okay. And, um, and so I walk outside. It's this beautiful reserve, this beautiful sound overlooking this duck. It's called Patriot Point in Baltimore. And um, I walk out there with this big old clunky ankle bracelet on. And I said, and uh, on the outside, I'm mocking these guys. On the inside, I said, Jesus, I said, if you're real, I said, show up here, man. And uh, if you do, if you do, if you're real, whoever you are, if you're still real in my life, I said, I'll tell people about it, whether it be one person or a million the rest of my life, man. That's how, that's how low I am. And uh, the next day, um, these two guys set me down and, and started praying with me. And I'm bored. And I'm like, I don't want to tell my story to these guys. They look like cops, two cops. I tell them that. They said, Jimmy, we're not the FBI. And, I, and they said, Jimmy, tell us about your story. And I start going through a similar story I'm telling you right now, but the PG-13 version. And uh, when I get to the McAfee part, I stop and I skip over it. And the guy looks at me and says, uh, he says, Jimmy, you just skipped over part of your story. And I said, no, I didn't. And he says, yeah, you did. I said, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? And he goes, yeah, it matters. He goes, in fact, was that at the, the Love Boat House that time? It was a dark time. And I, and I 
brother, I, I stood up straight, and I looked at him. And I said, I said, what'd you say? And he said, was that, was that, was that at the Love Boat House? Because this mansion that I was in with McAfee was in the shape of a boat, and it was in the Love Boat series, the guy who built it. And I said, I said, hey, man, I said, I'm a fragile dude, and I'm facing a lot of time in prison. I said, I don't know, I don't know what kind of game you're playing. I don't know how you know that. I said, but I'm out of here if you do that again. I'm out. And I stood up. And he says, whoa, whoa, calm down. This is what we do here. Uh, we ask Jesus to come in, and, and, and he does the heavy lifting. He does whatever he wants to do here. So, so if you please sit down and let us. I said, no. I said, I'll stand, man. I said, if you know so much about my past, if you know so much, then tell me more. And he said, well, uh, this was at a place called the Love Boat or the Love Shack. And I used to, with the nickname, I called it was the Love Shack. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And they said, when you walk in, there's a hot tub to the right, and there's a, an armory where you keep weapons inside the house, and there's three levels to this house. It's in the shape of a boat. They walk me through, just like they were there with a video camera. And I, and I just keep saying, well, I said, tell me more. And he said, there's rooms in the love boat shack, and there's, they're labeled by grid coordinates. And I said, Latin longs, like to correct him. He said, okay, Latin longs. And I said, Ann, tell me more. He says, well, there's an office at the top, which was my beautiful office overlooking the Ocracoke Sound, where Blackbeard used to evade the, the British man of warships in the shallow waters, super shallow. McAfee used to get stuck out there. And I said, yeah. And he said, and it's overlooking a sound, and boats pull up right to the house. I said, yeah, and it's got an elevator in the house. I said, yeah. And he said, the elevator's hidden by a cherry door. I said, and and I'm getting pissed off. Because if some, you know, some people pay psychics because... They tell them maybe their birthday or something they want to hear. This is not stuff I want to hear. They're telling me something I just try to hide from everybody. But God's in every dark corner. And um, the final thing I said was I got real mad and I was angry. And I stood up and I got in their face. I said, I said, if you know everything, I said, then tell me more. And that's the last thing I said. And because they said um, there was a path uh, you used to walk down. Behind the house. Take your time, man. We don't have to. We don't have to go down that road if you don't want to. That was it, man, for me, because I knew right there. There's no way nobody can know that, because that was a. When I was walking down that path, it was a dark time in my life, and I I cried out to God, and I didn't think He could hear me. And they were showing me right there that they were showing me that. God, God, God was there in every dark corner, and it didn't matter what I did in my life. He was true love, and that's where people get it messed up with religion is they think he's judging and all this stuff, but he was true love, and, and Jesus, Jesus literally showed up there, and, and they said, in your case, is going to get dismissed. We see a big checkerboard, and uh, we hear checkmate, and I didn't really believe that part, but I couldn't deny the, what they had just told me. The, the, you didn't believe that it was going to get dismissed? No, no, no way. My lawyer said it was a one in 1,000 chance. The FBI spent too much time on me, you know. So um, what, what happened after that? So I, I said, checkmate, what do you mean? They said, haven't you ever played chess? I said, no, not really. They said, it means your case will be dismissed. And I, they see a checkerboard. I said, man, this is crazy. But I knew that there's no way they could have known this path and this stuff. And, and, and all of a sudden, physically, I had a change. It was like I dropped off two sea bags of rocks, man, like major breakthrough. And so so I'm like, okay, well, I said, well, God's real, and uh, I'm still going to prison. And so I go home uh, with my big old ankle bracelet, go back on house arrest, and I'm sitting there, and uh, the, the lawyer calls me not too long after I'm home, not right away, but right when I, but when I get home, the lawyer calls me, and uh, he says, uh, Hey, Jimmy, he said, checkmate. I said, I said, what'd you say? He said, ain't you ever played chess? I said, I said, I, somebody else told me that. What does that mean? He says, I forget it. He said, your case is dismissed. Your criminal case is getting dismissed. He said, Jimmy, I've, I've never in my life, in my entire time, working for the DOJ as a prosecutor and working as a high, expensive Texas crypto lawyer, and a defense lawyer have seen this in my life. He said, please say a prayer for me. And that was it, man. And I was released. Just like that. 
just like that. Like they just came and said, "You're free to go." Not, not, not just like that. Like in, uh, in they came over with a pair of scissors and cut off. It took some time to process that. You know, Mac McAfee had been found dead in a Spanish prison, and that was part of the reason. And because um, uh, we were going to be tried together when he got extradited, um, but he had been found dead, hung in a prison, and so um, they started processing my case. And I had to check some box off, but just stay on house arrest for another, probably another few months. And, uh, I mean, it's like I didn't get released right off the bat, but they said, you know, your case is dismissed. And then they processed it through, and then I was I was done, man. When they first arrested you, that's when they took all the weapons? Yeah, so when they first arrested me, they, um, they, they said they can either confiscate all the weapons or my dad... Um, they really played off my relationship with my mom and dad, and so they knew I was real close to them. So they wanted them to sign over their house, their like uh, um, their land and stuff. But my dad refused to do that, like as a as a promissory bond. Like if I ran, they could go Take after his stuff. And so, but I, I signed the five million dollar promissory bond, and um, they um, uh, they made my dad took the guns and put them in a storage unit oh, okay. during that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a. Wild, wild story, man. Yeah. I mean, holy hell. Um, uh, when it finally did get released and you got released off of house arrest, they actually take the ankle bracelet off. What's the first thing you did? Brother, the first thing I did was um, I bought a, a big, big ring. <laughs> yeah. I bought a big diamond ring, brother, a real big one. And... Uh, and because my girl deserved it after all that time, I put her through hell. Yeah, my my girl and uh, we had been together for five, four years, five years, four years through two eight years being on house arrest and, and going through that hell. And I promised I'm gonna go rescue my beauty, uh, and uh, that's what I did. I left the country, and uh, we met in Costa Rica, and then Mexico, and then I got her over here, worked her visa, got lawyers. And uh, live in Miami now, man. It's uh, it, my life has changed forever. How long ago uh, was the house arrest, or was the case dismissed, and you let let go? When when what month and year was that? Oh man, I don't even remember. Uh, yeah, my, um, my boy Cav has a dang hyperplasia weird <laughs> secret matrix numbers. He remembers every day. He's like, oh, yeah. that was February thirteenth, bro. Yeah. Remember? And I'm like, bro, I don't even remember the date. Remember what year it was? Yeah, it was it was a uh, twenty. 2022, um, I was released off house arrest. Okay. Uh, 2022 and maybe August. Okay. 2022. Yeah. So straight to meet your your Russian girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. He proposed to her. Yeah. Um, she's bring from, her in. She's from Moscow, man. She's from Chengiz Khan, though. She looks different than oh, yeah. other, you know. Almost looks like uh, from Uzbekistan or the you know, yeah. Southwest Asia yeah. looked more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Man. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful girl, man. Yeah. Um, Wonderful girl. That's, man, what an incredible story. Um, I mean, for sure, a, a book. <laughs> it's like a movie. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. You you and, uh, and T-Cab, I think, uh, both of you need fucking your own movies written about you, man. But at the, not even a movie. Like, both of you would need, like, the Netflix 10-part miniseries. You know I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, a movie isn't going to cut it. You'd need, like, 10 one-hour episodes to, to cover all that, man. That's crazy. Well, what's crazy, man, is me and TCAV actually met in Hawaii for the last time four or five years ago. Yeah. And he was he was like, bro, I don't know what to do in my life. I'm thinking about going to the French Foreign Legion, bro. And I was like, dude, I don't know what to do in my life. I'm on the run from the FBI. I'm thinking about going to do mercenary work. He went French Foreign Legion. I went mercenary. Yeah. And uh, and then we met up in Miami recently, man, kind of yeah. a reunion. It was kind of crazy, kind of epic, bro. Crazy, yeah. I mean, and now and now both of you have, have uh, been here to the show, which is yeah. amazing, amazing story. Uh, since then, what have you been doing professionally? Like, what uh, what what's your what what's for you moving forward? Well, part part of my experience at Operation Restore Warrior, it's not like I get downloads from God and hear this and hear this. The but one thing I heard was, "You'll be a lighthouse unto my people." And uh, and what does a lighthouse do? It just guides lost ships in the night home. And the reason why that's for, not to just get them in a safe harbor, 
but so they can actually be safe on land and see that there's a whole world behind the lighthouse. And so I have taken a full dedication vow into helping other people find their purpose in their life, break chains of addiction, because God saved me from all of it, all addictions, porn, girls, alcohol, drugs, everything. And so now my purpose is I started a warrior tribe. I call it the warrior tribe because we need a tribe as men. It's an all men's group. Uh, and um, uh, it's been pretty phenomenal. I do three calls a week. I put my, my whole life into this. And so um, I run that in social media, trying to put the yeah. word out. You know? Yeah. Amazing, man. I'm super proud of the turnaround and, uh, and all the things that you've been through and what you've made out of it. It's uh, truly inspiring, man. I mean, big time. I, I knew that you had a wild story. I had no idea what it was, <laughs> yeah. uh, which I, I try to go into each interview as, as ignorant as possible to the That's guest, great, uh, which, which is the opposite uh, than a lot of people do. I think I, I have found that for me, uh, just it goes a lot better if I don't know jack shit about you, you know, because then, then I'm as curious as the listener while you're telling the story, you know, but, um, phenomenal stuff. Um, real quick, uh, recently Sean Strickland, I want to t touch that just real quick. He yeah, yeah. ran his mouth about, you know, something to the effect and maybe, maybe Zach can buffer a short part of the clip in, but just basically saying like, I hear all this talk about how tough Navy SEALs are and fucking, you know, I don't see it and I'm tired of hearing it and, you know, come spend a week with me and I'll fucking Stop. break you and all this stuff. And yeah. so you, you put out kind of a response video that, that blew up quite a bit and, and got responses from other people in the community. And, I, you know, I don't want to spend a, a ton of time talking about it, but what, what was the deal with that? Yeah, so basically, you know, I, I, I had seen Sean Strickland all over, never had a problem with the guy, nothing, you know, zero. Uh, one of my buddies sent me a clip of him Talk, you know, talking trash about seals, like I'll, I'll fucking break you, bro. You know all this. You come spend a, a week in my world. I'm thinking, man, this guy um, just has no idea. He needs to get out more. You know yeah. what I mean? Because uh, he just doesn't have an idea of of, of the pain train that that's involved in seal training. Uh, what's what? Uh, it's a life. It's not just a week, a hell week. It's not just a months and buds and SQD. You know, it's, it's a lifestyle. And, uh, and, and a lot of our buddies have died. And, yeah. and when people talk like that, you know, in the SEAL bars, like in the bars back in the day, if, if somebody talked like that, I would haul off and just, you know, knock them over, you know, and, uh, or get knocked over doing it, you know. And, um, but when, when people say that kind of stuff, it's ignorance. And it really wasn't about Sean. It was about who he's influencing. He influences a very high number of extremely young men. That's the hate mail I've got from it. Yeah. It's like 15, 18 year old men. And that's who his followers are. And, and it's highly influential. And you should never go around talking about uh, killing people, uh, taking souls, like it's some glamorous thing, man. War is no match for her aftermath. War is hell. The aftermath war is a thousand times worse lost a lot of good friends, you have to. And when somebody like Sean Strickland gets on there and runs his mouth, it's his uh, type of person that I'm speaking to. Never meant that video to go even viral. I yeah. just kicked it out. Like, hey, bro, this is for you, bro. It's a personal thing with me. Yeah. Talking trash about our boys, and that's it. Yeah. To me, I just, I, I took it more as, uh, as, I mean, almost like misspeaking, you know, because when I, when I really listened to, what he was saying, and, and if I try to remove myself from the the bias of being a team guy, uh -huh. um, you know, to me it's it just like it was disappointing because it's like, man, you know, you're obviously one of the best guys in the world at what you do, and 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 you're extremely dedicated, extremely talented. You've you've worked your entire life to refine a very specific skill set, and you're and you're one of the best at it. And and hats off to you. But right now, you're, you're, you know, the the UFC to me was one of the rare bastions left in the athlete, in the professional athletic world that that didn't become diluted and, and overwhelmed with the elitist, out of touch, rim job professional athlete that doesn't know how the real world works. Yeah. And to me, like when he did that, he, he kind of ruined that for me for the UFC. It's like you you now are coming across like the out of touch jackass yeah. professional athlete that do doesn't know what the fuck you're talking about. To me that that was the biggest part of it that that rubbed me wrong is that like if, if you were to say 
F- come fight me and I'll fuck any Navy SEAL up. He's probably right. Like, yeah, you know, they're, they're absolutely like in, in a, you know, especially in a cage match with rules and probably even in a street fight. Maybe not, but probably, uh, you know, yeah, if there's fucking guns and knives and chairs and bottles, it's a whole different story, but, <laughs> but that's not even the point. You know, the, to me, the point was, is like, I'll break you like dude, SEAL training is six and a half months of, of a staff of professional instructors who their entire job is to break you and they couldn't do it, you know, in six and a half months. So how are you going to do it in a week? Now, again, like, I don't know if he meant like I can beat you in a fight. Like, yeah, you you could like, are you going to get guys to quit in a week of your training? I doubt it. You know, like that's the whole point of it, you know, but uh, again, like to me, all that other stuff aside, it just, it, it really, for me, was disheartening because I, I, I love the UFC. I, I love MMA. I love combative sports. I train, you know, in, in combatives a, a lot, you know, several days a week. And, and I, I kind of, from a lifestyle standpoint, live that that culture athletically because I, I focus heavy on it. And, uh, and it just, it really fucking made me sad, honestly, to see him turn into that same jackass you know that, that you see in in basketball and in football and you know where guys are making millions of dollars or, or have such smoke blown up their ass for so long that they kind of become um their egos become so inflated that like they don't even know what's real anymore you know and, and it seemed like he kind of turned into that which was just disheartening yeah pr- pride comes before the downfall they say and uh, you know, if if I knew what I did now about Sean Strickland, seeing some of his other videos where he's talking about, you know, him being possibly bipolar, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, some weird stuff like that. And he's obviously had some real issues in life. I probably would have went a little lighter because it's like, it's like, man, this guy has issues. And uh, but you're responsible for your words and yeah. what comes out. And when he did that, man, he had that one coming. It was low hanging fruit for me. Yeah. And it's just a, it's a, it's an obvious deal for me. I'm gonna back my boys up. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You got a bunch of shit from uh, all his minions of uh, supporters or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got a lot. I got a lot of dudes that were like, "Hey, bro, good job." Shut his mouth. A lot of team guys to support. But, but on the flip side of that, I got a lot of guys saying weird stuff, like. You know, I'll come over and I'll kill you, bro. And like all this weird stuff. And I'm like, dude, who's this guy? Like, what's up? Give me your address, you know, yeah. at first. And then, of course not. And uh, I look at their page and it's like this young kid. And I started going, yeah. ooh, wait a second. I didn't know his, I didn't know his followers were so young, you know. And that, but that just, you got to be careful what you say. Yeah, I mean, you get the the late teen, early 20s, super impressionable yep. guys, you know, and uh yeah, you got to be careful with what you tell them and how you how you tell yeah. them. That. You know, you've you've got to have some backdrop on life experience and 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 and, and like provide some context around it. You know, and I, I don't think uh, I don't think he thinks about that before he posts stuff. You yeah, know? you got to show respect. Yeah. You know, like John Jones even got on there and uh, messaged after after that and said, "Man, this is." The first time I'm embarrassed to say I'm an MMA fighter. That was dumb, Sean. Yeah, I mean, because it was dumb, right? Yeah. It, it was it was kind of. I just don't get the reason for it. You know, it's like, obviously it's an ego thing, but I still, it's like, dude, you're one of the best fighters in the world. Like, what do you have to prove running your mouth saying, like, like, are you that, I don't know if it's an insecurity. Like, I don't know how you could be being, being that good at fighting. How, like, are you insecure to the point where if you hear somebody being talked about as also being super tough, that like that threatens your manhood. I'm like, I just don't get it. You know, it's like, where, where is it coming from? Yeah, and you know, you know as well as I do. After being in this game a while, like when somebody talks like that, you hear a lot of buds candidates talk like that, or yeah. guys that quit, or guys that you know. It's 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 a guy who wished he was a seal that talking about or had like dreams about it, and now he's made himself in the MMA world. Which mad respect to this guy for being such a you know going in there and, and pipe hitting dudes. I mean like hard hitting dudes. Yeah. I mean, that that's to me is a warrior facing off. Yeah. I, I mean, love the MMA community. Yeah. Well, and you think about percentage wise, like the percent of, of people that can say I've been a UFC champion is far more elite than the SEAL community. You know, like, what, like, dude, you got nothing left to prove. Like yeah. you're a tough fucking dude. You're a total badass. Like you work hard. You're committed. Like what, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, like what, where's your heartburn coming from? I, I don't get it. But anyway, I won't, won't spend any more time on it, but, uh, 
Man, dude, what a what a story. Um, thank you so much for sharing it. Um, is there anything else you want to bring up? I know you want to talk about Touchpoint Nation and, and how people can uh, can join or, or be a part of it. How how can people find you? Uh, you know, for all the all the things that you're trying to accomplish now. Man, first of all, I really appreciate you having me on here, and yeah. I and I appreciate your audience for listening to this story. If this kind of pulled at your heart to come over uh, to my social media platform, Mighty Warrior 2023 on on uh, Instagram, and Mighty 2024, Mighty Warrior 2024 on. Uh, TikTok and uh, YouTube. If this touched you, man, and you want to um, redefine your life with purpose, reignite that that God given purpose in you, I I hope that you come over to my channel and click that link and and join up the Mighty Warrior Tribe. We got some amazing stuff going on, and guys are kind of congregating all around uh, from the nation and doing it and seeing uh, incredible incredible breakthrough. So thank you for that. Dude, thank you for coming, man. I know uh, I know the listeners are going to love this uh, story for sure, and it's going to resonate well with a ton of people. So uh, thank you again for coming and taking the time. Man, man. Honor's mine, brother. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, in in tradition, we're a new tradition. Uh, we uh, we I say uh, we uh, champion choice silver makes the buckles. John Johnston in California, a good friend of mine, uh, has donated these buckles to uh, to all of our guests. I want you to to pick uh, which which one you want. You're a Texas boy. You get your shit kickers on, brother. Yes, as well as a coin. Yeah, here. you want so, me to come on over yeah, there? Come check on it over, out. Pick pick which one you want. All here. right, let's do it. Let me get this tangled up here. Let's see here. What we got? Oh man, this is nice. Do I want the most flashy? It's crazy prob- one. This prob- one. Probably that one. Okay, it's got real. Right? It's got real silver in it. So if this was the Holy Grail, I'd be picking the wrong one. <laughs> oh, it's awesome, man! If you if you could show it to the yeah, uh, so to the camera there, quick. Check it out. Yeah. You got so many cameras in here. I know it. It's hard, it's hard to know. It's check like. This, I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Good stuff. Hey, appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Me. Absolutely, thank man. You. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for this. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's your lid there if you want. Thank to. you, sir, for that. Yeah. The most that, slashy one. Yeah. Um, to the listener, thank you to you guys. I know, uh, you know, there's a lot of choices out there when it comes to podcasts. We do our best to bring you uh, the best guests that we can. Uh, and I know time is the most precious resource. So I, I do sincerely appreciate you spending your time with us uh, show after show and showing us the support that you do. So thank you to you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, you can choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.